Thank you all for joining us for our webinar on the Open COVID Pledge at One Year, Looking Back and Looking Ahead. In this recording, the beginning was cut off, and so you'll hear it begin with our first speaker, Professor Mark Lindley. It is um, sort of worth, worth knowing as a sort of case study and kind of how people can get things done on the fly in a, uh, in a short period of time in a pandemic. Uh, you may recall um, uh, that uh, uh, things changed pretty rapidly in March of 2020. Um, uh, on, uh, uh, on March 7th, I was planning to get on a plane to Israel for a two-week vacation on March 8th. Uh, we decided a couple of hours before the uh, uh, flight that maybe it wasn't a good idea. Uh, that turned out to be right. Israel locked down on March 9th. Uh, the U.S. started locking down, of course, uh, um, bits and pieces sometime that week. Uh, but I think by March 11th, March 12th, it was pretty clear that there was something uh, quite serious going on. Um, and one of the things I want to flag is that um, almost immediately, a group of folks in the scientific community um, uh, that includes James Phillips um, uh, and uh, Jenny Malloy uh, and Ariel uh, Bakanakans um, started working together uh, to try to put together a, a project to get people to commit uh, to uh, developing and releasing technology to, uh, to fight the plague. Um, I got roped in uh, on uh, March 18th uh, when they decided that maybe they needed a lawyer. Uh, Diane uh, 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 Peters, uh, who you're going to hear from later, uh, came in, uh, in within a day or so. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did uh, that I think helped set the tone a little bit for this was uh, to decide that what we needed was not a uh, large multi-page fully lawyered license agreement, uh, but something uh, short, uh, simple, accessible uh, to non-lawyers uh, who might uh, both want to commit their intellectual property, but also who wa might want to know what intellectual property was accessible to them. Uh, so I actually just sat down and drafted something because uh, something needed to be drafted. Diane came in uh, and with her experience in the in the Creative Commons side of things, uh, started to help tweak it. George, who you're going to hear from shortly, came in uh, and, uh, and we started playing with the language. Uh, but the initial drafting of uh, what became the Open COVID Pledge uh, was something that uh, took a very short period of time. And in that time, we made some of the central decisions that I think you're going to hear from uh, George about uh, what's in and what's out, uh, what people can do and what they can't do. Uh, and those decisions, I think, help shape uh, the later commitments to the pledge. They help shape what people can do with this information. And I think they hopefully will, uh, will also serve as a blueprint uh, for things going forward. Um, this is, in short, not something that was kind of done with great deliberation. This was done uh, kind of in the same way that, uh, uh, that Moderna put together its uh, vaccine, right, which is sequence this thing, work fast, uh, and uh, try, to, uh, try to figure things out on an uh, emergency basis because we had to get something out the door now uh, and not uh, something uh, six months from now. Uh, so with that, I think I will uh, uh, turn it over to George, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about where we are uh, and uh, what, the, what the last year has looked like. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, um, Mark and uh, Mike and Meredith. So let's see if you cannot um, see my slides with me as a little a figure in the corner, just uh, give a shout because that's what I think I'm uh, projecting here. Um, but uh, it is great to be here uh, for this one year uh, anniversary celebration of, of the Open COVID Pledge. It really was a, um, an amazing project to be involved with. Um, and I, I remember getting the email and the call from Diane to uh, first participate in this when I was on the last vacation that I took um, uh, in, in the last uh, 15 months, which was uh, in Death Valley, um, which uh, maybe a little bit appropriate. But, you know, if, if you uh, remember back in March, when, as Mark said, this uh, uh, phenomenon 
started to uh, become well known in the US, there were a lot of news stories that were appearing um, in social media, on news feeds about the way that intellectual property rights were being perceived as potential threats to the rapid uh, manufacture, production, supply, and even development of products needed to fight the pandemic, right? So things like valves to repair ventilators, uh, respirator uh, masks, um, the drug uh, remdesivir, um, and a variety of others were subject pretty early on in the pandemic to patent disputes of one kind or another. And, and that was alarming to many of us out there in the community. Um, one of the people who um, couldn't join us today, but uh, was another one of the founders of this project was Frank Tietze at Cambridge University. And he and his group uh, did a landscape analysis very quickly of the types of patents uh, that, that were out there that covered uh, what he called crisis critical uh, crisis critical products of, of various kinds. And I know these charts are too hard to read on the screen, but uh, suffice it to say that there were a lot of patents out there already, a lot of carryovers from prior disease outbreaks like SARS and MERS and H1N1, um, but also new applications being filed all the time. Um, so there are a lot of patents and there is a perception that these might pose a problem uh, for the rapid response to the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, as a matter of IP theory, uh, we know that there are a number of mechanisms to grant greater access to IP in times of crisis. Um, there's compulsory licensing, there are formal patent pools and so forth, and there are informal pledges. Um, compulsory licensing is something that's been studied quite a lot, and a number of people have written about this in the context of COVID-19, right? Compulsory licensing is allowed under TRIPS, the uh, international agreement uh, under the, uh, the WTO treaty that relates to intellectual property. It's been pretty clear for the last 20 years uh, that um, countries can uh, create compulsory licensing regimens where access to IP is granted to third parties uh, for some sort of reasonable royalty to meet demand uh, and to, uh, to address public health needs in those countries. And compulsory licenses have been granted in countries over the last 20 years, uh, primarily in the global south um, relating to infectious diseases. Uh, when COVID-19 came along, there were calls for compulsory licensing in some surprising countries, countries that typically hadn't granted these, countries like Israel and Germany, uh, France, Canada, um, as well as um, a number of countries in uh, South and Central America. Um, these measures, uh, while they may be effective in those countries, are undoubtedly unpopular uh, with industry. Um, in the United States, there are a couple of compulsory licensing style measures which haven't been used particularly uh, much. It's kind of an understatement um, in the case of marching rights under the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, uh, which relates to federally funded technology. Uh, those rights have never been exercised. Um, the government can also uh, use without the consent of an IP owner intellectual property for government purposes. This has usually uh, been invoked in the case of military needs and needs uh, for uh, the military and veterans hospitals. Um, but again, it hasn't been for quite a number of years uh, that these provisions have been exercised in the context of public health or uh, drugs or uh, other public health measures. Um, IPR pools and clearinghouses are also used. They're well known in some industries. They've been around for more than a century and a half. Um, they are efficient when they work um, in industries like semiconductors and uh, uh, computers and uh, so forth. Um, they've had limited success in the biopharmaceutical sector. Pools were proposed for a number of bio uh, innovations over the last 20 years and never have really taken off. Um, yet in March of 2020, the government of Costa Rica made a, a public call to the World Health Organization to organize a pool 
around COVID-19 uh, technologies, therapies, uh, and so forth. And this uh, call uh, was uh, hopeful uh, and, and uh, based on models that had existed already for about 10 years um, under the uh, aegis of the World Health Organization, uh, one of which is the medicines patent pool, which has proved to be successful um, in getting uh, patented technology, primarily in the uh, HIV, tuberculosis, and hepatitis C uh, indications out to uh, manufacturers for supply in the developing world. Um, large companies uh, listed here on the slide have granted licenses to the medicines patent pool, which have then sub-licensed them out to generics manufacturers uh, for distribution of drugs in least developed countries and developing countries. Some of these licenses are royalty bearing, um, some aren't. Um, the, um, the, the issue, uh, if any, with these types of arrangements is that they, they do take some time to put together um, and it has taken the medicines patent pool a while to, um, to get up to speed. Um, and so, um, Another alternative to this are more informal and rapid and easy to execute patent pledges made famous, uh, although not invented, by Elon Musk back in 2014 uh, when he audaciously posted on his blog uh, that all our patents are belong to you, um, which at that point were about 300 uh, patents belonging to Tesla Motors. Um, and uh, Musk pledged that Tesla would not initiate lawsuits against anyone who wanted to use its technology in the electrical vehicle industry. A fairly surprising move, um, but one that fits into a pattern of patent pledges that have existed over the years. They're voluntary commitments made to the public by patent holders. And when I say patent, I include other types of intellectual property here as well. Um, to do what? To limit the enforcement of their rights and without any direct promise of compensation. Right? These types of pledges have emerged across the board in a number of places. Um, they first really came to public notice in the open source code area back in the early 90s um, when uh, Sun Microsystems and IBM and uh, others uh, pledged that they would not enforce their patents against implementations of the Unix operating system. Um, pledges like this are very common in the world of interoperability standards and most of the standards that uh, connect our devices and computers today are subject to some sort of pledge either to uh, uh, license patents for no royalties or on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. There have been a number of pledge efforts in the green and clean tech space, and even in the biopharma space, there, there have been some. So there's a long history of these types of mechanisms. Um, they are, to a large degree, legally enforceable, um, and they, take, they come in a couple of flavors. You can have pledges only, which is what companies do when they simply promise to the public that they won't assert their patents in some area but they can be more complex and uh, have a bit more legal heft as well if they're coupled with a licensing agreement. Um, and uh, there is pretty much precedent for these types of arrangements. Um, we believe they're legally enforceable under a number of theories, including contract, estoppel, antitrust theories, property theories. Um, and, and again, we draw on uh, the world of these uh, licensing commitments in the standards area in which there have been numerous uh, lawsuits and decisions in a number of countries recognizing the enforceability of these commitments, as well as open source code licenses, uh, which have been litigated in a number of countries um, and uh, uh, generally are, are viewed to be enforceable legal instruments. So in the world of COVID-19, um, a number of entities early on in the pandemic did start to pledge patents and other intellectual property to the fight against COVID-19. These include uh, hospital equipment, ventilator manufacturers like Medtronic and Smith's Group, um, uh, therapeutic uh, manufacturers such as AbbVie, which uh, probably in response to the government of Israel's 
uh, compulsory licensing order around its drug Coletra, a pledge that it would not uh, enforce its Coletra patents uh, against other users. The uh, Innovative Genomics Institute at University of California, Berkeley, um, uh, for Mike Eisen, who is one of the uh, Open COVID Pledge founders, uh, is from this institute. They also pledged uh, many of their valuable intellectual property rights uh, to this fortress. Uh, investments, which is a patent assertion and holding company, uh, acquired about 700 patents from the defunct company Theranos, which you may know from books and movies like Bad Blood, um, uh, despite the fact that their uh, blood testing technology never actually uh, worked. Um, they still managed to get a large portfolio of patents, which uh, fortresses Subsidiary Labrador began to enforce early on in the pandemic against diagnostics companies, but uh, then given public backlash, thought better of it and pledged that they would not assert those patents in the context of COVID-19. And probably the most important and largest of these pledges is uh, the one made by Moderna, uh, the manufacturer and developer of the first mRNA vaccine uh, to hit the market and the holder of a number of fairly uh, foundational patents um, in the area of mRNA vaccine delivery technology. Um, and so, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, um, a group of 10 of us coalesced uh, throughout March of last year to figure out how we could create a framework that was user-friendly and uh, easy to implement that would enable others uh, who didn't uh, feel compelled to create their own a uh, special unilateral pledge as the companies and institutes in the previous slide did, but still wanted to help and be involved and make their patent assets available uh, in the fight against COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, we, we did put pen to paper and, you know, bits to uh, monitors and, and tried to come up with some principles uh, as we were going along that uh, defined what it was that we were trying to do, right? And so we wanted something that was gonna be legally enforceable. Um, that's kind of the whole point. We are lawyers after all, but also something that was going to be attractive to pledgers, the companies and institutions with intellectual property, and that would also be attractive to users, um, implementers of that technology, right? We didn't want something uh, that was going to be so difficult or onerous for either of these groups um, that they wouldn't use it. Um, and so we came up with a group of design principles, again, kind of as we went along. Um, simplicity was one of the important ones. Um, we wanted something that didn't require a lawyer to understand, something that was gonna be immediately recognizable and understandable to anyone who looked at it. We wanted uniformity. Um, uh, Mark mentioned uh, Diane Peters, um, the general counsel of Creative Commons, and Eric Stoyer, who's also from Creative Commons, were part of our initial group. Um, and the beauty of the Creative Commons uh, licenses and structure, um, as we'll hear uh, later in, in the presentation, is their uniformity. Um, their, uh, the, the uniformity uh, does all sorts of good things for one of these systems. It engenders trust. It makes adoption easy and quick. Um, it has network effects. Uh, the more of the same type of license that are out there, um, the, the more compatible everything is. And so we wanted that. Uh, we wanted something that was self-executing, something that would not require, you know, printing and signing and scanning uh, documents that were 10 pages long. Um, some uh, other uh, pledging efforts and frameworks that arose around the same time do have these types of more uh, legally document uh, heavy uh, structures, but, but we thought, no, we wanted it to be quite easy to do uh, all online and without, um, without negotiation or signature and delivery of documents. We wanted the scope to be limited. Um, we didn't want to give the impression that we were asking IP holders to give away their portfolios uh, for all uses and for nothing. Um, we wanted the scope to be limited just to the pandemic um, and only during the term of the pandemic and for a one year uh, ramp down period after that. And then finally, uh, it had to be free, right? We, we didn't want to bog down a negotiations with uh, negotiation, sorry, over 
royalty rates, even royalty rates that were fair and reasonable. Um, the standards world has showed us that uh, those negotiations are not easy and everyone has a different idea of what a fair and reasonable royalty rate is. So the simplest and most direct way to do this was to have things be free, at least during the pandemic. Um, and why not just ask entities to contribute their IP to the public domain? Uh, that's certainly an option that some have thought about and we thought about, uh, but we wanted to allow IP owners to keep their IP uh, for a number of reasons. Number one is defensive use. Um, if an IP holder just contributes all of its IP to the public and then later is attacked, by someone with its own IP, it's kind of defenseless. And that scenario is something that IP owners, of course, want to avoid. And so if we didn't allow defensive use of IP, uh, we thought we would get far fewer contributors. Um, we also wanted to assure IP owners that they could continue to earn profits and returns from their IP outside the area of COVID-19. So for example, AbbVie's Coletra drug is um, an AIDS drug. It wasn't developed for uh, COVID-19. Um, we, we didn't want to uh, try to take away companies outside markets since our focus was really just on the immediate emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally, if you keep your IP and don't give it away, then you can enforce the terms of your license. This is modeled on the uh, open source code licenses like the general public license, um, which allows entities to retain their IP so that they can then enforce um, that IP against people who are violating the terms of the licenses that they granted. Um, and so to cut right to the chase, we developed the open COVID pledge. And, and here it is. Um, the pledge itself is just this one sentence in the middle. We pledge to make our intellectual property available free of charge for use in ending the COVID-19 pandemic and minimizing the impact of the disease. Um, this again, we hope is simple enough that everybody can understand it. For those who don't, we have a long FAQ um, that talks about what this means. And there are a number of variants and uh, possibilities uh, that, that entities can use when they sign up for the pledge. It doesn't have to be all of their intellectual property. Uh, we have had pledgeors who have committed everything from like one patent application to entire portfolios of over 100,000 patents. So um, there's a great uh, variety. Now here, I won't go through this in detail, but this is the license or one of the forms of template license agreements that backs up uh, the pledge itself. Um, it is structured like uh, the Creative Commons suite of licenses, right? If you know Creative Commons, they have uh, easy to recognize um, emblems and icons that say what kind of license is being granted. But if you click down through the fine print, they're backed up by uh, legal license agreements on uh, the Creative Commons website. And that's what this uh, structure does. It talks about the grant and the scope of the license, how long it lasts, um, ties in regulatory exclusivities that might be granted by drug approval agencies, talk about the defensive suspension uh, that I mentioned earlier if someone is attacked, and uh, also makes it clear that this IP is being licensed without warranties. Uh, you're on your own. It's just a freedom to operate um, and not a guarantee that you will be successful. So uh, to cut right to the end of this, the Open COVID Pledge, we were quite uh, taken and uh, pleased with its take up. Um, of the 30 entities that publicly committed to <coughs> um, pledge their IP, uh, we estimate that over 500,000 patents are in this body. They come from the high tech industry, small and medium entities, two US national laboratories, uh, a university, and a couple of coalitions. Sorry, I'm blocking some of these, I think, with my little image in, in Japan uh, that went on alongside the Open COVID Pledge, inspired, we think, uh, by it, um, that attracted significant uh, take up in Japan. Over 100 Japanese industrial firms uh, committing over a million uh, patents led by um, a biotech company, Gino Concierge Kyoto. 
um, again, which um, uh, shows that there is significant worldwide interest in programs like this. Okay, so I'm going to spend the last few minutes of this talk talking about what happened, like what were the results of the open COVID pledge. And I'm going to go to um, a taxonomy that uh, Frank Tietze and his collaborators created um, around products that are critical for response to a global health emergency like this. He divided these into five different categories. Um, and um, there are sort of the biopharma, innovations, diagnostics, medical equipment, PPE, and digital innovations. And so if you map those to the pledges that were made both through the Open COVID pledge and through all uh, pledges, including the unilateral pledges and, and some other pledges that uh, have been made alongside of this, um, you can see that the interest and the pledging activity varies uh, depending on the product category. Um, and so why is that? Uh, let's just take a quick walk through what the categories are and what the pledging activity has been. So far and away, the most pledging activity has occurred in the area of digital innovation. And, and this is a large area. Um, everything from research tools relating to drug discovery and uh, productization to contact tracing um, and uh, public health and epidemiology, uh, disease modeling uh, algorithms, a large number of uh, patents and copyrights around uh, infrastructure and logistics, uh, everything from um, emergency vehicle uh, routing uh, in, in, in emergencies to uh, the shipment and storage of uh, cold uh, products uh, through the supply chain, especially vaccines. Uh, IBM has a significant uh, cold, cold product logistical a uh, body of intellectual property. And then quite importantly, information reliability uh, algorithms and products. Uh, companies like Facebook um, have contributed a significant amount of IP around the assurance of accuracy in social media and news media around information relating to public health outbreaks like COVID-19. Um, in the area of PPE, um, there has been a significant amount of pledging. Also, the national laboratories, Sandia and uh, NASA JPL, uh, created a significant amount of IP in this space and made it publicly available. Everything from uh, evaluations of 800 different mask varieties uh, by Sandia to uh, these uh, uh, 3D printable um, N95 uh, respirators by JPL, and then small companies with uh, sort of products that, that are uh, intended. This one in the upper right corner is a dental, um, a, a dental a procedure shield to protect dental workers um, while they're performing procedures on, on patients. So it's a large variety of um, PPE. Oops, sorry. On the devices and medical equipment side of things, most of the attention has been focused on uh, hospital ventilators uh, with good reason. Uh, they're critical technologies in the uh, treatment of the symptoms of COVID-19, but they are fragile and their parts break and there are not enough of them. Um, and so from the beginning of the pandemic, um, Smith's group and uh, Medtronic uh, were generous in pledging their uh, technology um, and design files and so forth uh, to the public for use in combating the pandemic. Um, the Open Ventilator Systems Initiative is a UK-based um, uh, initiative to create a, um, a, a public source or an open source uh, ventilator uh, that's mobile, that's uh, primarily intended for use in the developing world. Um, and then we have other smaller uh, medical devices and equipment, um, which again, if you know anything about hospitals and procurement, all of these little devices and swab holders and so forth cost a lot of money. Um, uh, but um, some of the pledgeors uh, who joined the Open COVID pledge have uh, contributed their technology relating to these, again, mostly 3D printable um, devices. In the diagnostic space, um, diagnostics ranges from uh, very basic technology around pathogen uh, detection 
um, which a number of pledgeors have in their portfolios to the specific diagnostics type technologies held by Fortress. Um, and then uh, even uh, testing procedures and setups like Sandia's uh, designs for drive up uh, COVID-19 testing booths. Some of you may have been tested using one of these drive up booths, um, which uh, believe it or not is, is protected by intellectual property, but that IP has been pledged. And then finally, uh, sort of the big elephant in the room is the biopharma space. Um, so under the open COVID pledge, IP has been pledged in this area. Um, companies with vast IP portfolios like IBM have IP covering things like antiviral agents. Um, the open source RADVAC initiative um, out of Harvard um, uh, contributed its IP, but uh, more substantially, um, it's the unilateral pledges by groups like Moderna and AbbVie and the IGI at Berkeley uh, that have contributed here. Um, that being said, uh, there, there has not been across the board pledging in this area. And, and we've thought a bit about why this might be, why this lag and gap in the biopharma sector. And I think if you, you don't have to dig very far to understand why this is. And the amounts at stake are huge, billions of dollars, um, as you see in news reports uh, that come out every week, are being paid uh, to the biopharmaceutical sector for supply of, um, of vaccines in particular. Um, any entity that has a winning product has a ready market uh, that, that is huge. There are also admittedly large investments that uh, are need to be recouped in this sector. And that being said, I, I suspect that those investments have already been recouped many times over um, just in the initial months of, um, of vaccine production. But uh, that is the traditional story and the philosophy uh, that pervades this industry. Um, interestingly, uh, we, we have been really privileged to uh, ally with Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, UAEM, which uh, has an initiative called Free the Vaccine for COVID-19. They did a fun little mock-up here of, of a box that features the open COVID pledge. Um, this is not a real test, uh, it's, it's just uh, Photoshop. Um, but they have been active in trying to get universities to uh, pledge their intellectual property, um, especially now when um, the vaccine shortages in much of the uh, world outside of the United States and uh, highly developed countries is becoming uh, pressing. Um, and so they are making great progress and we'll actually hear uh, from um, Mayor uh, in later on in this program about UAEM and the great work that it's doing. Um, so just to wrap this all up, um, pledges of intellectual property can do a lot of things, even below the level of 100% coverage of a particular technology, right? When pledges are made, they start to clear the field of patent litigation risk. And even partial clearance can reduce inhibition um, and new market entry in the field of innovation uh, in, in these areas, right? When a large number of pledges are made in a particular field, for example, take contact tracing, um, that is a signal to small app developers, developers around the world, that it is okay to develop contact tracing apps and uh, expect that you won't be sued for patent infringement, which is a very real risk in many technology sectors. Um, so we think that this is quite important and has had a big impact, we hope, um, on some of these areas. Um, you know, the open COVID pledge, as, as we'll hear throughout this talk, it, it is, number one, it's a legal framework developed by some volunteer uh, academics and scientists and engineers, but it's also a thing now with a website um, and, and some, some real um, heft behind it. And so um, we also are trying to ensure that it survives and, and remains robust over the years. And so stewardship of this organization is now important. And uh, for uh, the first part of its existence, Creative Commons played an integral role 
um, in that stewardship. And now, as you can see, uh, the program on information justice and IP here at American University is, is taking on uh, that role to ensure that the pledge um, remains robust and vibrant um, throughout uh, at least the remainder of this pandemic. Uh, we are linked up with a number of allied efforts. Um, we, as Diane and others will discuss later, uh, there has been significant legitimization of the pledge by intellect or international bodies like the World Health Organization. Uh, thanks to the efforts of Creative Commons, the pledge has been translated into the principal uh, United Nations languages, and those can be found on, on the website. Um, and there, there is, however, more work to be done, and we're eager to continue it in this kind of second year and uh, however long that takes. And as Mark alluded uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this meeting, you know, there, there are, of course, we want the Open COVID Pledge to help in the uh, response to COVID-19. But as academics and, and, and scientists and engineers and lawyers, you know, we also are hopeful that this will provide a usable framework for the future. And we've learned some lessons and we hope that those can be applied uh, to things like the next pandemic. And as we'll hear at the end of this, uh, this, this meeting, um, climate change, which is another huge issue, of course, uh, that uh, is going to uh, face us all and is facing us all right now. Um, and so we'll hear about efforts that are already underway um, to create IP sharing platforms in that area. Um, if I, I, I wouldn't be a proper academic if I didn't include at the end of my slides a lengthy list of uh, papers and further reading that you're all uh, invited to peruse at your convenience. Um, and with that, I will wrap it up and uh, turn it back over to, uh, I guess, Meredith to introduce the next panel. Thank you very much, George. Um, we have a few seconds if you'd like. Uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat um, that you could address now or we could hold towards the end. I don't know if you had a chance to look at those. Um, no, I obviously have not looked at the questions while so I've been the, speaking. The first two questions. One is from um, a participant who asked whether or not there's sort of a, a sort of broader, more durable public commons of technology that could be used to address sort of further crises, whether there's something to do to sort of not have to sort of redo this effort to take action to address the next crisis. Um, and the other question that I'll just add together and with that, if you want to respond is whether or not there's any cultural explanation or study of why the Japanese got better uptake of their, some of their pledge efforts, particularly in the biotech space. Yeah, yeah. Okay, th th those are great questions. So, you know, number one, is there some sort of generalized IP sharing platform um, that might exist, maybe with different branches, one for COVID-19, one for COVID-25, one for climate change. Um, there is not such a thing yet, but I mean, it is something that we're thinking about. Um, we, we have learned some lessons uh, from, from the Open COVID Pledge. You know, I think that in the area of viral disease outbreaks, um, we, we have learned a lot, and I think that uh, we very quickly will be able to put together something um, that, that, you know, heaven forbid, if there's another outbreak, um, that, that will be workable. Um, with respect to other technology types, you know, they, they may or may not share the same characteristics. Again, we'll talk about climate change at, at the end. Climate change is a different type of problem in some ways than a uh, disease outbreak. Um, they share some characteristics, it shares characteristics, and it, it differs in some ways. So is there a generalizable solution for every public emergency? Probably not. Um, that being said, there can definitely be a set of tools uh, that's made available that, uh, that, that can be helpful in enabling sharing in, in these ways. Um, okay, remind me, what was the second question? The second question is about uh, whether you had any speculation about why the Japanese pledge was more successful in attracting uh, biotechnology companies. Yeah, yeah. So a, a purely informal speculation at, at this point. But, um, you know, our intent is to talk to uh, Gino Concierge Kyoto 
um, and compare notes and, and try to get a handle on why this might be. Um, you know, in the biopharma space, there hasn't been huge take up really in, in either uh, geography, but, but uh, some large Japanese chemical companies do have significant biopharma arms and those are covered uh, under the Japanese pledge. You know, um, there, there are many possibilities as, as to why cultural, um, legal, business-wise, and, and so forth. Uh, we, but we haven't studied these at any, uh, you know, with any level of academic rigor yet. But it is certainly something that I'm interested in, and, and we do plan to reach out to, uh, to them and, uh, you know, see if we can uncover some interesting, interesting, uh, interesting thoughts. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so for our next panel, um, I'm happy to introduce um, our participants who will include um, Eric Stoyer, the Creative Director at Creative Commons, Michael Eisen, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator and Professor of Genetics, Genomics and Development at the UC Berkeley, uh, Benjamin Truhoff, the CEO and President of Helpful Engineering, and Isabella Fu, the Associate General Counsel at Microsoft. Um, this panel will focus on sort of motivations and um, initial sort of interest in participating in the Open COVID Pledge and what ways different participants saw both institutional and organizational benefit. Um, for this panel, our first speaker was planning to be Eric Stoyer, but he's having some um, internet issues there. And so he will be joining us um, in just a few minutes, uh, but the panel is going to be hosted by George. So maybe if you can talk a little bit, George, about what you were hoping to sort of bring out in this panel. And I've also seen that the two participants of your panel that have joined us are um, Benjamin Truhoff and Isabella Fu. So George, back to you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, right, so, so just to give you a, a general sense for the layout of, of the rest of the day and, and this panel, right? Uh, this, so this first panel, um, we have a number of people who are involved in the Open COVID Pledge who are going to talk about their perspectives um, on uh, why their institutions joined, um, you know, and what, what it means uh, for their institutions and their industries. We're going to broaden out the focus um, in the next panel, which, which will be moderated by Diane, um, to talk about some of the broader um, sort of social and geopolitical uh, implications of, of the pledge. And we'll end it then with a uh, discussion led by Meredith um, about future directions. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to uh, stick with us for all of these. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll schedule some breaks uh, in between these if people need to uh, get up and, and stretch their legs. Um, and so with that, so for this panel, um, uh, we, if Eric is not able to, uh, to kick us off, um, but Isabella is on the line, then uh, why don't we start with Isabella Fu from Microsoft, which is one of our a very early and first pledgeors um, and, and a very important uh, cornerstone tenant of the Open COVID Pledge. Thanks for having me here, George. Um, it's hard to believe it's been a year. Uh, I think I, I was looking over some notes of um, a talk that I gave at Creative Commons um, early on on this topic, and it it reminded me how sort of quaint and optimistic I probably was back then. <laughs> um, and yet we're facing another surge um, in India and other parts of the world. So, um, but getting back to the main topic, why I think the you, I was asked to talk about why Microsoft wanted to join this pledge and um, what our motivations behind that were. Um, we really wanted to be a founding member to build momentum behind some new things around IP and thinking about how IP can be used really to spur innovation, um, aside from looking at patents as just exclusionary instruments. So I think the, the sort of, I think what we're all taught in school or, you know, and a lot of rhetoric that we hear today is about how you need, you need really strong patents and really strong patent rights in order to encourage innovation. Otherwise, there won't be incentives to innovate. Um, and I think what we've seen over the years, at least in the computing industry, is something a little bit different. There's obviously been a huge um, growth in things like open source, and now there's talk about things like open data. And we see more and more that 
patents, um, as George was alluding to earlier, can be a little bit of a blocker with respect to innovation. So we're looking at it more holistically and thinking about the exclusionary aspects of patents, as well as the collaborative aspects of patents. And the fact that really the patent system is designed to, um, to encourage people to read patents um, and to learn from them and to build upon them as opposed to simply exclude people. Um, and so what we have in the tech industry today is, is a phenomenon where um, there are thousands and thousands of patents that can cover a, a product. Think about a, a server in a data center or a laptop. Each of those can potentially be covered by thousands and thousands of patents. And I think this is no surprise to a lot of people, but there has been, at least in the tech industry, a, a huge growth in patent assertion by entities who don't actually make products, but rather you know, own patents to assert them and either gain licensing revenues or some other you know, monetary benefit, typically just a monetary benefit. Um, and we've seen the type of litigation spread um, at Microsoft, you know, from companies like Microsoft to a bunch of our customers in more traditional industries that are trying to digitally transform their, um, their general operations. And so they're getting more and more into the space of where we are in, and they are also facing more and more li um, litigation or threats of litigation on patents that, you know, people claim are blocking. Um, so patents have become a little bit of a minefield. And, you know, so it's no surprise, I guess, when the pandemic hit um, a little over a year ago that we actually got some questions about some of the patents that people found in our portfolio and wondered whether or not they could get a license to use them. Um, and we certainly felt that we didn't want our patents to be blockers. We also didn't necessarily want to have to engage in a license negotiation with every single one. Um, I was also on a panel speaking with um, the head of IP at a, at a company that um, developed some diagnostic tests for COVID. And, you know, I, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised to learn, but I heard more and more from smaller companies that uh, said they do a lot of freedom to innovate searches. And so, you know, it was my thinking that if we, if we could at least remove, you know, the Microsoft portfolio and if other companies would do the same as a blocker to at least, you know, research and developing, um, products and services and technologies that would help end the pandemic, that we should do that. And, you know, the, as you know, the, the pledge itself is, is temporary. Um, it has, you know, some protections should patents be asserted against us. And so it seemed to us, it was, you know, it was a good thing to do with our portfolio to at least remove um, any blockers that were to innovation that people might perceive in our portfolio. Um, and then also to encourage a lot of other companies to do the same because, you know, we're all in this together. Um, so, you know, it. I think the pledge also aligned with many of our other corporate principles. We've taken on a num number of other patent pledges and other open data pledges. Um, we obviously spend a lot of time on open source as well. And so this aligns with all of those thinking that innovation really requires a lot of collaboration and requires removing of a lot of barriers. Um, just some of our other initiatives around this, we have um, we, we pledged um, a lot of our patents around differential privacy um, to a project, an open source project at Harvard. Um, they actually approached us and asked us, they, know, they knew that we had some patents on this and they asked us if we would license the patents um, for use with their open source project. We did that. Um, we also have another program where we've um, made available source code as well as I think over 50 patents relating to um, our airband initiative, which is, which is designed to um, allow you know to build technologies to reach um, to to enable broadband access in rural areas, which again I think is really important during the pandemic. We've seen you know how you know great the digital divide has been and how we want to really you know cure that. Um, finally, we have our newest pledge that was just taken last week, and I think Brett Alton from HPE is going to talk about it a little bit more later in the program. But we also um, committed to the low carbon patent pledge, uh, which in which we've pledged about 120 uh, patents royalty free um, for use in the generation distribution and storage of energy from, I think it's the list of solar, wind, um, ocean, uh, hydropower, and I think ge geothermal sources. Um, and so it's similar to the COVID pledge in that it has some dis defensive suspension issues, um, but it's royalty free. Um, you can find it again. I think Brett will give you the website number. But um, you know, similar to the COVID issue, you know, 
what we're seeing now with respect to COVID is there's a lot of talk about um, compulsory licensing on, for example, vaccines. And a lot of the companies rightfully point out that you know that's not that's not all that's necessary in order to distribute the vaccine. There's all of the distribution and manufacturing of the vaccine that's really necessary, which involves more than just the folks that own the patents on you know simply the vaccine itself. And recognizing this, I think, is is really important when we think about uh, climate change and um, collaboration to end or to you know slow down climate change. Again, we may not be an energy company, but um, the distribution and storage and and um, uh, and generation of that does rely a lot on things that we at Microsoft do and that we do in our data centers. And we thought it was important to let people you know, look at our patents and build upon that um, build upon that technology as necessary. So that's why we did this, George. I don't know if you had questions or. Great. No, well, Isabel, thank thank you very much. I will uh, we'll we'll save or my plan was to save questions until till the end, um, if if that's okay. Um, and so uh, Eric Stoyer now has uh, I, I believe has joined us. Um, yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Great. So so I want to turn it over to Eric. Um, who is from Creative Commons. And as I mentioned earlier, Creative Commons was a really instrumental um, foundational uh, institutional partner uh, for the Open COVID Pledge. And um, Eric was with us from, uh, from the beginning, uh, helping to, uh, to, to bring this to fruition. So I'll turn it over uh, to Eric to say a few words. Thank you. And I apologize that I'm audio only. I think I should be audio only. I, uh, my internet went out, so I'm calling in by phone. But uh, if uh, you can hear me, then that's all we need. Um, so yeah, I mean, Creative Commons, as I think most people would know, is I think pretty good at uh, making things open and working with partners to make sure that things are open in a way that is accessible and broadly so. But I think we have done uh, less work over the last uh, many years in targeting specific needs, especially urgent ones. And this was something that was really important for us to, uh, to be able to do with this project is to say that this approach uh, that Creative Commons users around the world would be familiar with is something that we supported and wanted to work on making uh, something that would expand towards uh, a, 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 a need that was that was very specific and, and uh, that was that gave us the opportunity to do that with this with this project and, and I think um, as, as just alluded to uh, with the the uh, the carbon pledge that, that, that that's something that we were excited to uh, work on also is the idea of having um, impact with a project that we could then extend to other kinds of efforts at Creative Commons and then be participants in uh, not necessarily projects that originate from Creative Commons, but that we would work on as partners or collaborators using this approach uh, as a kind of template for ways that we might address other urgent needs uh, to uh, take the, the, the tools and the principles and, and uh, the um, just the, the sort of style of, of the Open COVID Pledge and applying it to other kinds of uh, crises, especially climate change, which is one of the things we're the most excited about, uh, we're not excited about, we're interested in and excited about working on it. Um, so I think one of the things that Creative Commons especially was excited about working on this project for was because we've got an international community of people that's very activated and engaged and that we wanted to be able to, um, you know, extend the utility of the project by working closely with that uh, that group, which is called the Creative Commons Global Network. And we worked with them to do a fair amount of translations of the pledge pretty quickly, which was uh, um, one of the, the projects that Creative Commons took on as soon as we became the stewards of the of Open COVID Pledge and uh, held some workshops with members of our community to help educate them and get them up to speed on what exactly the project was so that they could go out into their own communities and talk to decision makers, policy makers, innovators, et cetera, about why they would want to take the Open COVID Pledge. And we saw some pretty good uptake and, and response from that pretty uh, quickly when uh, we started getting incoming email and um, you know just queries about how to get involved from people that we were not otherwise would have not have been in touch with. Um, 
I do want to, of course, just say how grateful we were to the group of people that started this project because uh, it is it was, it was such a it's such a great idea at the right time, of course. And Creative Commons felt honored to be able to come in and be able to play a role. But the collaborators that we had were just uh, they've been so excellent and um, and uh, in, in forging the project and, uh, and and bringing it to fruition as quickly as they did. Um, yeah, beyond beyond that, I, I'm uh, I'm I'm mostly just wanting to uh, say again that, that for us this is the beginning of how Creative Commons I think is going to be thinking about uh, how to work with partners and people interested in um, using not only copyright licenses like the kind that Creative Commons does, but this this approach generally to more specifically address needs and not just to put things out there in an open way, which is an important thing for us, of course, but we, we really wanna target and focus that energy around uh, particular efforts and needs so that we can connect the people that might be able to use them, the, the intellectual property that's put out in this kind of approach and, uh, and, and, and do a little bit of more um, direct uh, building around them that stuff so that it's not just you know it's expanding the world of what's what's openly licensed but actually making some connections so that uh, so good things can happen from that uh, and we think like that this has increasingly become a, a mantra at Creative Commons is that it is, is it you, you could keep opening things up but if no one's able to find them or use them then, then kind of what's the point and this is such a, a great example of how you you, uh, you, you create value out of open. That's it. Great, Eric, thanks Thanks so much. The Creative Commons has been a, uh, a really uh, phenomenal partner um, in this effort. And so we look forward to working together on, on this and uh, you know the, the ones that come next. Um, so next, um, you know, one of the, uh, the people who was involved in our original design group and really one of the very first people uh, to think about the open COVID pledge um, was, um, was James Phillips at a company called Helpful Engineering. Um, and so uh, Benjamin Troy Haft, um, who is the CEO of Helpful Engineering is, uh, is here and I'll turn over the, uh, the floor to, uh, so that he can share some of uh, his perspectives. Uh, hi, it's nice to speak with all of you today. Um, I don't know what you, know or if you're familiar with Helpful, but uh, Helpful is an unusual phenomena. Uh, back in March, uh, you know, uh, maybe 20 people, including uh, uh, James Phillips, met on a Slack to discuss how to mitigate impending obvious shortages that were going to exist in medical supply chain. In the course of mere weeks, uh, those 20 became 400. In the course of three weeks, it became 13,000. And now it's over 19,000 uh, registered folks uh, within our community, working principally uh, on open innovation, uh, addressing medical, uh, medical supplies, medical engineering, uh, medical equipment. Um, for some of us, it's been an observational process to watch what this rather singular event, not just in terms of COVID, but the, the formation of what Helpful was, which represents one of the, the largest collective, uh, just get together and get to work to fix something events, uh, you know, I think that anybody knows of, uh, and, and to try to unpack what came out of it. And, what the real consequence, what the real meaning of it has been over, you know, since not just during COVID, what we've been able to accomplish and over time. We really rapidly understood very quickly the only way that this community was going to work and the kind of people that were there were if we were functioning on an open basis. And we began to pick through, again, I think, you know, things that many people have understood in open source for a long time, the real benefits of it. And those are fundamental principles of what helpful is now as a, as a not-for-profit, a registered not-for-profit that supports this community in producing this type of innovation. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we looked at everything from the way devices are made, pharma is made, uh, uh, you know, what were these blockers in government, across governments, uh, you know, whether out of the WHO, the UN, 
uh, USG, other governments, even in the EU. Why did why was there why could a coordinated response not exist? What were the challenges around that? Why did business freeze? Uh, uh, and business did freeze uh, because business is very much it's risk averse. Nobody, I think, really felt like they had good data or good appreciation of what this meant uh, coming out of a medical family that may, has made pharmaceuticals for many years i you know we were like this is a disaster back in november we already knew this was going to be bad uh uh but for for us it's it's been a study process uh and where we've evolved to longitudinally has been we've learned how to make things very quickly We've learned to we've learned a great deal about regulation, the regulated the regulatory landscapes across multiple industries, and how much of the way you know these old business models, what we consider to be old business models, around what IP is, ranging from the patent system and the defensive nature of them, to even some of the current limitations as we speak with some of the the, the real forward thinkers in open source licensing, uh, you know where those are, where the limitations are as uh, you know, and as an open design, for example, moves in and out of a proprietary tool of one flavor or another. Uh, you know, some of the economic constraints around even open data sets, the cost assembled with assembling them, uh, maintaining them, all of these things, uh, all with an eye to trying to figure out how does this never happen again, not just in the context of COVID, but, um, you know, then what how can we take advantage of what we've learned during this time moving forward into recovery? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and what can that impact look like? Um, so that has, that's largely, I think, sums up what Helpful is. What we do is, is you know, we take projects in and we micro-grant them and move them along and give them understanding of what regulatory is. But we also serve a, a, you know, a ginormous a ginormous uh, coordination uh, 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 function of putting together the right resource, whether that be human, uh, you know, an introduction, uh, you know, to business uh, or uh, an individual that might better inform uh, the the needs, demands of of, of Roddick. But we've we've result, you know, what we've observed is that um, our model is really very effective. Several of our designs right out of the gate back in April were first to market in their class. We call them to market, although we didn't make these things ourselves. Uh, we simply published designs. So whether these were instructions about a better face mask than what CDC was publishing, who said wrap a cotton bandana around your head. Okay, great. You know, with a waterborne, you know, a, a, a waterborne viral transmission vector, let's do that. Uh, what actually blocks it? Well, uh, you know, one of our, the scientists in our community, a material scientist named Jocelyn Sager, published a design about how to make a proper mask with proper materials research uh, using woven polypropylene. That was back in, in, in the end of April. And that has spawned countless imitators, in, you know, people repurposing materials, ongoing materials research and discovery around what possible variants you might use if you need to make something locally, quickly, off the shelf that's available in your home even. And that has had enormous impact. We've seen these designs downloaded more than 20 million times across various sources. Uh, laser cut face shields, first one out, uh, made all over the United States, all over the world, and now endless variants, uh, you know, some of which have uh, even uh, achieved uh, 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 EC certification. Um, uh, a respirator, which, which I suggest people take a look at, the open standard respirator at openstandardrespirator.org, uh, which was one of the first ones to be designed in a six-week design sprint. Uh, it's now been tested by the U.S. Army, uh, and it's in front of FDA. Um, there have been many other things that have come out of Helpful that in one way or another have had some sort of meaningful impact, and, on, and we hope in a small way blunted uh, you know, this crisis and maybe saved a few folks' lives. What we've learned well, additionally longitudinally is we, in our activities is that the biggest function we serve is this coordination function and the ability to provide this safe, neutral space around the way people work and share together uh, in IP and, and provide the knowledge that they need to, to crack the black box of regulatory because we made a decision very early on that every single thing that got made here, whether it fell within a regulated domain or a regulated space, needed to be made with that rigor what are you doing? How are you doing it? How do you prove that it is safe? 
All right, that's fundamental. Uh, and it's not something that I think uh, a lot of folks necessarily think about when they bring their product or service to market, what the uh, what emergent properties might be called, if we're going to speak about this in formal terms, the unintended consequences. Unintended consequences can be good or bad. Uh, other things that we really studied as we interacted across USG uh, and, and uh, with, with VC funders is taking a very hard look at what, you know, what is normally known to most people as the valley of death when it comes to innovation or in uh, the venture capital community and strike rate, you know, the one in a hundred uh, model, uh, you know, which I think is frankly a terrible number. <laughs> uh, but um, it's really now no longer uh, a, a valley of death, it's a plane of death uh, because we have the lowest number of small business starts in this country at any point in time we have for six years. How do we look at that, let alone around the world, how do we how do we recover from this? And how, what are the lessons that we learn from COVID as we move along in all of this? And the answer to this has largely for us been, it is openness. It's openness, it's traceability, it's accountability. And these all, fun, these all funnel in to uh, rethinking IP models. Uh, and it, it, for us, I think, you know, when looking at the open COVID pledge, it just, for us, it, it was just kind of an obvious thing that we were this thing because that's why we existed was to, to create IP to address COVID. Uh, but now we see, uh, you know, a great many other possibilities in these, in these things and we explore other models around them. One of the, the most important things that's come out of this for us, aside from a few designs that, that you know, have been proof of concept around our developmental methodologies, but has been really rethinking what, what does intellectual property sharing look like? What does supply chain look like? And we have done very, very, very deep dives in this. This has resulted, um, we have an engagement that we're at the conclusion of the first phase of which with, uh, with uh, physical cyber systems at NIST under the Department of Commerce and the creation of a supply chain interoperability specification, so a framework and a specification that will soon be published. And uh, the next phase of that will be the establishment of working groups. This is an, an open specification uh, that will allow for uh, interactions uh, between entities that they can set their definitions around, whether open, closed, like we don't, you know, that's not our business and we don't care. But what we do care is that there is a way to map these interactions together in a, in a, in a fast way. And we have, uh, uh, we're quite far along in the proofs around this, the mathematical proofs about how this works and uh, uh, publication of that will be forthcoming. Uh, and and uh, you know, the biggest component when we talk about all these things, and I think whether we're talking about it from the perspective of a regulator or the, the perspective of industry, uh, you know, somebody that might hold a patent, a product, a process, whatever, is, um, you know, trust. How do I know that it, not only that it's safe, but my interests are maybe protected or that it's going to do what I intended it to do or that somebody's not going to, you know, pervert that process. So we've been designing those trust processes as well. It's important that people share information. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, whether it's in science and, uh, or whether it's in business, uh, you know, the iteration of a product or a service or whatever. And it's very clear to us uh, that there, people in MBA programs are taught, uh, you know, that you, uh, you, you create value through differentiation. Uh, it's also clear to me that that represents a great deal of products that are out there that represent square, you know, round pegs trying to fit in square holes or square pegs into round holes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that most people are highly dissatisfied <laughs> with what they have to purchase and consume. Uh, and that that is not a necessary thing, either for uh, a consumer, a producer, somebody trying to invent something, bring it to market, monetize it, or to, if they're trying to cooperate in the event of something like a COVID, that it necessarily uh, results in them uh, giving away the keys to the kingdom. Uh, it, what it does do is get in the way of getting things done. Um, so we are looking at new models around these things. Uh, and one of the things that's exciting, has been exciting about something like whether it's the Open COVID Pledge or 
some of the open standards, uh, you know, open know-how, open nowhere, uh, that are emerging around uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, you know, these conversations, these mappings, is that people are recognizing that fluidity, as opposed to rigidity, is, uh, is to everybody's benefit. Uh, you get there faster, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and you get what you need much more precisely and more effectively at reduced risk uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to these silos of the way the world has been constructed previously. So you know, I'm, I'm really very encouraged by things like the Open COVID Pledge and what it's represented, the thought that's gone into it, uh, because it, it leads us in this direction and facilitates the beginnings of these really necessary conversations about what these interactions have to look like to create this fluidity, these, exchange, these exchanges of information at whatever level, you know, it might be entity to entity or, uh, uh, you know, a corporate entity to corporate entity, government to government. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, what is clear is that it is ultimately really a conversation about efficiency in response in all contexts of response. Uh, and um, uh, we think that it's, it's longitudinally going to, going to reap real value for the world, not just in the disaster context, but, uh, but in, 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 in many other ways. Uh, so those are, those are, that's what, that's what I can offer you uh, uh, from Helpful and, and where we're at, what we've done, uh, and uh, wh where we're going forward as we look to not only advance and improve our models of innovation around our IP, the, the areas of activity that we're in, as we look to expand beyond medical into energy, food chain, uh, uh, you know, uh, transportation and, and other areas, but, uh, you know, with an eye towards greater development around the globe uh, to bring other markets. As we bring other markets up to parity, that's opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a model that's, that's very inexpensive for, for that, but it relies upon the exchange, the open exchange of information in a way that's uh, voluntary, but benefits in a bi-directional manner. So, right. Looking, learn, looking to learn from one another is, I think, the lesson that comes out from things like the Open Code mm -hmm. Challenge. Great. Well, Benjamin, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, Helpful Engineering was, uh, you know, early foundational um, supporter of, uh, of the Open COVID Pledge, and uh, we, we look forward to continuing to work together. Um, yes, as yes. And then, so um, the last person that uh, I'd like to introduce for this panel is Michael Eisen, um, who also was one of the very early uh, founders and initiators of the Open COVID Pledge. He's a Coward Hughes investigator and a professor of genetics and microbiology at the University of California, Berkeley, and affiliated with the Innovative Genomics Institute, IGI at Berkeley, which I had mentioned earlier as one of the very first uh, institutions to commit uh, its intellectual property uh, patents um, in connection with responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, Michael, over, over to you. Great, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. I usually fail when I try to be brief, but try to be brief. Um, the, the, um, so my involvement in this happened very early in um, in COVID, you know, sort of pretty much immediately after it became clear that we were going to have to deal with this as a global pandemic, not just something we watched from afar. Um, scientists, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere, but, you know, at Berkeley, there was a huge effort spearheaded by the IGI to bring all the people on campus who had ideas or any, really anything to contribute or just wanted to help. Um, um, you know, with a scientific response to COVID um, came together and we had a series of meetings um, where people, you know, spitballed ideas and we self-organized into groups that were thinking about testing and drug therapies and monitoring in the community and, you know, developing, you know, basically developing ideas and technology that were going to be useful for, for COVID. And, um, uh, at the end of one of these meetings, there was a, um, a, a quick um, presentation from someone in Berkeley's tech transfer office. And, um, you know, they kind of just raised casually the, the issue of IP around the inventions. And, you know, I think 
their their involvement was entirely meant to to streamline the process of of get you know was not this was not a Berkeley make money kind of power play. This was about um, trying to make sure that whatever technology developed and um, uh, by scientists was going to be immediately useful. But uh, it struck me that that you know um, this conversation was happening within the assumption that the only way we had to to kind of leverage IP that was developed at Cal was to kind of go through the traditional kind of tech licensing world where it gets patented or copyrighted or whatever people are are doing. And then then some process ensues where negotiations are made to get access to this to this tech. And the, you know, I I've been on the the other side of that in a bunch of different contexts and seen just how kind of the casual um claiming of intellectual property around scientific um you know discoveries and ideas is is a, 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 a at best a rate limiting um phenomenon and at worst an actual obstacle to progress you know in my life where i spend time consulting for an in industry it's been true for you know for 25 years that half the time when we're trying to do something new we're we're spending it trying to navigate around intellectual property to try to figure out who we have to talk to to get rights to do something etc it's it slows it slows us down and this has been true now for a decade or more in academia where where the kind of research we do on a day-to-day -day basis is either um you know is 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 impeded by the fact that a lot of the technology we use and ideas we use our intellectual property, um, and you know, most of what I deal with is owned by universities and and other academic institutions. And so, I I saw this happening, and I uh, you know have it, having some experience with open licensing in the publishing world, I just thought, well, you know, this is really a mistake that that we should be taking a different tack here. That you know, every single day matters in how quickly we respond to COVID. With you know, you know. Uh, been doing some epidemiological modeling and watching people talk about it. And it was clear that, that, you know, we were talking about, you know, thousands and tens of thousands or cases, hundreds of thousands of people potentially dying in a single day. And if that was going to happen, we couldn't afford to spend uh, even an hour or two negotiating licenses with some tech transfer office. And so, uh, you know, I, um, you know, before this group coalesced, I, you know, you know, contacted some lawyers I knew, and we kind of drafted our own kind of um, thing for 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 Berkeley to consider, which was just to, you know, basically liberating their IP for the purposes of of use in in COVID, and just saying you have a permission to do whatever you want to, you you don't have to worry about it. And then, fortunately, our initial somewhat uh, slapdash and amateurish um, efforts were um, were um, we. Because of that, I was connected with the 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 um, Marx team at Stanford, and then ultimately with this wider group of of Jorge, Diane, and others who you either have or will hear from. And and it it I think was really great to take what was to to see that this that this instinct had emerged in so many different places around the world that people were seeing that that there was a, a problem here and that there was a tangible, practical way we could actually make a difference. I feel like, you know, of all the things that 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 I've spent time on during COVID, this has been the most impactful because it actually, it actually materialized, I think, in, in, in practical ways in the real world, you know, in ways that scientific research often, um, uh, you know, it, it happens, but it happens much more slowly. So anyway, it's been a, it's been awesome to work with this team and I'm, I'm psyched that that initial um that initial meeting at igi led to this great great well michael hey kate thanks thanks so much and thanks for your you know dedication and involvement uh from day one of this project but long before i uh, i was involved uh way back in uh, mid-march um so we have about 10 minutes left on this panel and i just wanted to see if any of the panelists um wanted to respond to like the question like what would you say to a company that owns intellectual property whether it's patents or copyrights or something else as they're considering whether or not to join the open covid pledge or a similar effort um you know we we 
attracted a lot of, of companies, but many more out there who, who didn't sign up um, for one reason or, or another. And what would you say to, uh, you know, to, to convince them um, to, to join? And any, any ideas from, from our panelists? Yeah, Benjamin, I see you raising your, your, uh, your real hand. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's, I'm trying to think quite how to put this. Uh, you know, as I said previously, many businesses, uh, or particularly C-suite executives, particularly who are trained uh, back in, and really that's who you want to speak to, right? You, the, the, the guy, the people who make the call. And the, you know, there's a fundamental belief amongst these folks because of the way they were trained at a certain period of time. And I could go down a rabbit hole on this one around uh, how business schools have uh, misinterpreted uh, and, and mistaught wealth of nations and the lessons uh, within that uh, framework for, for hundreds of years, uh, simply by virtue of the fact that when they teach the book, they don't remember that Adam Smith wrote a, a, a book on morals and values before that, and they don't teach that. Uh, but as a result, um, you know, one thing that I would say that they don't, that, that folks don't look at comprehensively is the benefits, the net benefits of being a good public citizen. And, you know, today there's a lot of confusion over why a company in many respects has the rights that an individual has but isn't held to the same moral or ethical standard or accountability standard. And that the way that those are, it's funny, I just got off a call with uh, an interesting, you know, an interesting individual from USG Today discussing this thing, uh, the, precisely this topic. And um, that, that, you know, we have to create externalities to or externalities are created for these companies that try to move these entities in this direction where, you know, of being responsible corporate citizenships. And, uh, you know, but the biggest thing is, is that the bottom line is, is if you're, you're just a freaking good, if you're just a good player, if you step up and you do the right thing, you get rewarded by people wanting to support you. That's it. It's that simple. You don't have to overly protect yourself or your market. You will find your market grow. And I think that's the language that you have to speak to folks too in C-suites who are looking at protection of shareholder value. They don't really recognize that, yeah, maybe they're squeezing an extra fraction of a cent or a couple cents or even a couple bucks on their share price at the same time that they're hurting their shareholder in the larger sense, although they're really only interested in certain large shareholders and maybe a few members of the board. <laughs> Great. Yes. Yeah, Isabella, go ahead. Yeah, I would respond to that a little bit. I think that um, at least in, in speaking with other lawyers at other companies that we've tried to recruit to some of these pledges, I do you think that um, Benjamin hit on a lot of the issues and what I hear is that, that you know, the C-suite or the engineers don't want to don't want to commit their IP because again they've been sort of taught in these traditional ways of thinking about IP as being you know a, an exclusionary right and that being you know, the sort of the, the paramount importance. Um, and I would say you know if you're a lawyer trying to convince your executive to do this, you know while what Benjamin said is you know it sounds really nice, I think they really want to see data. And I would challenge I don't anyone. Disagree. <laughs> yeah, I would challenge anyone outside of the pharmaceutical industry to really go back and look at what benefit they've gotten from a business standpoint at a macro level from holding their IP as opposed to licensing their IP. Um, and because I think when you actually really do that math, there's very few companies that benefit more from you know, asserting their patents and holding their patents, at least with respect to patents or even copyrights. I mean, it's a different thing with respect to piracy and that sort of stuff, but holding their collaborative IP than, than releasing it. And so I think you just have, you have to do that math 
it may not be that easy to do, but if I look back at sort of the, and I'm sure Mark Lemley can correct me on this, maybe George could too. If I look back at, you know, I've been practicing law for 30 years, um, and at least in the computing industry, I can't point to a situation where a patent really made a difference um, from a, 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 you know, a, a more larger sort of entity standpoint, like sure, maybe you get a few dollars here or there, but if you look and see whether or not that really changed the competitive dynamic in an industry, I think outside of the pharmaceutical area, it's hard to point to something where that really happened. And so you're fighting about things that probably in the grand scheme of things don't matter in the long term. But I think you have to do that math to actually show that. The other thing is these pledges always have, you know, a protective mechanism if somebody asserts patents against you. So, so you're not really giving up um, a whole lot in that respect, at least in, in terms of, you know, if your competitors come after you, you still got the, you still got the ability to, um, it's, to, you know, it's, to it's interesting. I, I, you know, one of the things that I, I would second absolutely everything that you just said in, uh, you know, it has to be data driven. And I think that we're at the beginning of seeing these types of models really, really done pharma in particular, um, uh, you know, struggles to do a lot of this. And it, well, a lot of that has to do with dysfunctions around uh, the distribution, uh, you know, the rebate mechanisms, uh, uh, you know, group, you know, the way the purchasing is done, um, uh, benefit management is done, uh, you know, which like, you know, look, it, it just, I mean, it, insulin costing a thousand dollars, like it costs less than a fraction of a penny to make. <laughs> it's just, it's absurd. Um, uh, and uh, the, the great observation I've always been making to pharma and that, you know, my, that we've been making is we try to, to open our holdings on the boards that we're on, we're on in pharma um, uh, has been that Look, there's ways to interoperate in the same way that tech has done, where every time tech manages to figure out how to collaborate, cooperate, and work together on something, that they unlock a couple extra 10, 20, 100 billion bucks in value. What, what, well, that's what a really good get? point. I mean, what is you there look to at get? like what's, right. what's the hard really part here? <laughs> I mean, but that's, I think, a, a sort of a macroeconomic point that, like, I don't think I have the math to do that. But I think you, may, you you raise a very good point. And you know, I'm not I'm not an expert on that type of thing. But I mean, you look at you know how much wealth and you know, for lack of a better term, driven. profits have been it generated is, here. What has this, driven it? Yeah, like 100, it is a hundred percent what has driven it. Uh, you know, the, the real value in our activity today is, you know, look, when we make stuff, any engineer, any engineer will tell you that the more, the, the more and better engineers and, when you, and customers you have in the room, when you build your product, when you build that technology, when you build that product, all right, the more commonality, like of the guts of the thing that you can agree upon, you produce a better variant of it, a better version of it. But if you can all then go differentiate it around the interface or the way that you interact with the thing, okay, so that might be UX, UI, the experience, and then the way you service the thing, that's your value. That's it. That's what makes you successful. Just what, uh, Mike Eisen, I see your mic. Yeah. Why, why don't we? No, I just add, you know, another, I mean, it's sort of an obvious point, but like, you know, whatever, even if you think you have some marginal profit to be squeezed out of IP you have around COVID, it, if you have the potential to actually shorten or lessen the impact of the pandemic, the economic, you know, the economic impact is going to be huge. And it's got to be true that for many of these companies, the biggest, the biggest threat to their future profitability, even if that's the lens you want to look at it through, has got to be a severe economic downturn because of a pandemic that doesn't go away. And so it's, I, I think there's a very short-term practical way of framing this, which is just like, if you've got something that can potentially shorten or lessen the impact of the pandemic, even if you could squeeze some dollars out of it, you, the, you'll get more dollars out of making sure the pandemic doesn't doesn't impact your business in the grander sense. And, and so I, I think it's you can sort of hit it in the short term and hit it in the long term. And I think they're they're the arguments the arguments in favor of of grabbing hold and keeping hold of the IP are much weaker. I would make the additional observation for people who have 
you know, who haven't participated in something like the open COVID pledge. And this would be my big argument to pharma, where I, you know, I've been fighting some battles like you wouldn't believe to try to see technology transfers to India and, and, and uh, you know, South America. Look, we can't make enough of this stuff here. And it's also a pain in the ass to transport it there. If you just go do it there, it, look how fast that market grows. So whether we're talking about a line of code, a hardware design, uh, a formulation, uh, you know, a, a process around this. Look, if you can interact with some trusted folks that are gonna do this in the right way. And look, trust is a hard thing. Uh, you know, that's why negotiations tend to take a long time, uh, especially when you're looking to cross borders uh, and you're working in different, uh, 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 you know, social and governmental environments. Um, uh, you know, that, look, that's a real challenge, but there are ways to do it. Um, but the faster you can move your IP, the faster you scale and the more revenue you generate per transaction. So it's, it, it actually subverts the argument of squeezing ROI or trying to you know, con build a constrained marketplace where you control the whole thing or you know, by brand. But pharma actually does a, a terrific job in this in some areas where they cross license, uh, you know, uh, you know, depending upon international jurisdiction, but they're bad at it at others. And it just makes me, it makes, it's not only essential in an emergency, it's frankly, success it's it's essential if you are really looking to 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 maximize your roi before somebody just engineers a solution around it so even if we're talking about stable good times speed of execution a, you know a truly lean concept uh across any domain whether we're manufacturing or we're just bringing a lot you're doing a launch of any sort that's how you get market penetration and actually maybe understand and, and, and can evolve best with the constraints or changes of what the, the actual business environment is. So it's not even about like that detail of who owns that little piece. It's, it's, it's really the bigger picture that you got to pay attention on if you're in that C-suite. And if you're not thinking that way, man, good luck in the years to come. Not just for the next disaster, but mm -hmm. for your business in general. Yeah. Yeah. So I will say, I just, <laughs> will say that all the arguments that you just make are playing out right now in in sort of 5G infrastructure and, and 5G rollout of 5G, you have um, a, a small group of entities that have invested heavily in the IP there who want to hold it tight, right, and, and maximize the profits on licensing those patents. And it's it's holding up, you know, the proliferation of that. And, and you know, it's very hard for me to convince people that, you know, if you should lower the price and make it really transparent, everyone will then build, but they can't build as long as there's mystery and the costs are unknown on this type of thing. But we, but, you know, I'll just say that, you know, there's a lot of activity, um, you know, at the European Commission, at, you know, in our US government that is propping up the, the notion of, you know, patents being very valuable and, and the necessity of protecting the patent holders rights there instead of making a more transparent, fluid um, transfer of IP through standardization or other or via other methods. So yeah, yeah, to the extent that you, you know, uh, can speak up about that, I think it would help. So, so Isabella has, has raised my other favorite uh, <laughs> topic, which is uh, standards essential patents, but um, we are out of time on this panel. Um, and that that's a, another good like six hours of, of discussion. Um, so with that, I mean, I think we need to uh, we wrap it up. But thank you to, uh, to to Benjamin, Mike, Isabella, and Eric um, for uh, for like really amazing insights on uh, on this panel. Um, we'll take a five minute break now um, while we switch over to uh, the next panel and uh, Diane. So Meredith, any other instructions for us as we? No, I, I was going to say, uh, for the speakers on the first panel, um, please go ahead and mute your audio and video for the second panel.
and we will take uh, about, yeah, a, hopefully maybe a three minute break and get started at um, 12 or 13 after. Just give everybody a moment to grab a second cup of coffee um, for our new co-host to join us and we'll get started in just uh, three or four minutes. Thank you very much. Hi all, uh, welcome back. Thank you for joining us for the second panel of today's uh, Open COVID anniversary event. The second panel will focus on the Open COVID pledge in the public interest and directions sort of beyond the original pledge. Um, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Diane Peters. Uh, Diane Peters served as the general counsel at Creative Commons during the majority of their stewardship of the pledge and we are now pleased that she's a partner at American University Washington College of Law as a senior policy fellow with our program on information justice and intellectual property. So uh, thank you very much, Diane, for joining us. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so the theme of this panel and what we'll explore is the open COVID pledge in the broader context of the public interest that it is intended to serve. Um, as mentioned at a few points during this meeting so far, there do exist several international coordinated efforts directed at solving the myriad problems related to COVID, um, perhaps most prominently and visibly led by the World Health Organization, which is here today. Um, the OCP does have 
an important role to play in these fora, having in common with them the goal of promoting the public interest. On this panel, we have three um, spectacular guests, um, each of whom has dedicated the greater part of this past year to promoting the public interest during this time of crises. I'll introduce each of them first with a very brief overview of the work in which they're engaged and they'll share more information. So first we have Dr. Jenny Malloy. She is in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. Um, Jenny is one of the co-founders of the OCP Coalition and has served on its steering committee since its earliest days. Among her significant contributions to the work of the committee, uh, Jenny did participate in the original landscaping project around patents that George mentioned earlier in his presentation and that served as an inspiration in part for the OCP. Um, she has also represented the Open COVID Pledge and has been deeply involved with the Technology Access Partnership. That was formed in May 2020. Um, TAP is a coalition of UN agencies organized by the UN Technology Bank, the UN Development Program, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, and of course, the World Health Organization. TAP recently concluded its work and Jenny will be telling us more about that. She's also going to share her thoughts on OCP's usefulness uh, for researcher innovations, as well as companies wishing to build on technologies that might otherwise be inaccessible at short notice. Uh, and uh, we all know that right now, time is of the essence. I'm also proud to have joined us today, Dr. Mary Angela Samal. She is the Assistant Director General of Access to Medicines and Health Products at the World Health Organization. Dr. Samal chairs the CTAP steering committee established under the auspices of the WHO and in which I participate. Um, CTAP is a technology access pool as compared to the technology access partnership that Jenny was, has been involved with. Um, CTAP was launched by WHO in May of 2020 in partnership with the government of Costa Rica, as George mentioned earlier, and now has 40 member state co-sponsors. Um, it has published a solidarity call to action that calls on the global community to voluntarily share knowledge in, in, and intellectual property and data necessary to address COVID. 19, as well as to scale up manufacturing and removal of barriers internationally. Um, the Open COVID Pledge is a CTAP implementing partner of the Solidarity Call to Action. We're very proud to be assisting with that. Um, given the very unique and innovative ways in which the pledge works as compared to the more traditional licensing models used by the medicines patent pool, um, for example. And then finally today we're joined by Marith Basie. She is the North American Executive Director of Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, or UAEM. That is a movement of university students which seeks to promote access to medicines for people in developing countries, ensure university medical research meets the needs of the majority of the world's population, and empower students to respond to access and innovation in crises. Um, she and her colleagues have been connected with us at the OCP since our beginnings on promoting awareness and adoption of the pledge at universities. She is going to highlight how the OCP and CTAP have been incorporated into their advocacy with the Free the Vaccine for COVID-19 campaign that they launched in April of 2020. Um, she's gonna highlight some key learnings from engagement with universities and some key actions related to COVID-19, including the Open COVID Pledge. So as you see, we have a lot of um, great, dedicated, thoughtful experts joining us to talk about the OCP in the larger context of serving the public interest. Hopefully we'll have time at the end of this panel for a few questions or if not at the end of the program. Um, but now let's get underway and I'll turn it over to Dr. Malloy who will kick off the panel. Jenny. Thank you very much, Diane. I hope you can hear me. I'm actually going to just, I realize my um, defaulted to another microphone. Hopefully that's a bit better. Um, so thanks so much for the invitation to speak. As Diane mentioned, I was involved from not the very earliest days of the OCP, but quite quite early on 
um, as the concept was being formed. And the reason that I got involved was because uh, my research here in Cambridge and generally the work that I've been involved in for a few years now looks at how openness and open source technologies play out in biotechnology, which um, as we've heard in the previous panel is an area where um, patenting is, is certainly the default. So my work actually addresses more um, diagnostics and molecular biology in general, as opposed to pharmaceuticals, but um, it's a space where it was clear that action was needed in terms of addressing the COVID pandemic um, and basically any mechanism by which we could free up more accessibility to technologies was um, seemed imperative uh, when we started the pledge a year ago. Uh, so I was really pleased to get involved. Um, if anything, the Open COVID pledge perhaps does not go as far as I would like some of the sharing of technologies to go in that we had to be realistic about what we could expect companies to adopt at short notice. And, and part of the goal of having a pledge was that kind of idea of, of having universities or companies or any other IP holder make their patents or copyrights available very rapidly in a way that would not take a huge um, level of transaction cost and kind of, you know, different um, agencies or organizations to interact, but could be done unilaterally by the patent holder. So I think that that was one of the, the aspects of um, the OCP that really appealed to me when I got involved. And also, of course, it was an amazing team who really came together to try and bring this forward. And um, from, from a sort of, from my point of view, being in a university, and I know that this has been addressed earlier in the event as well, that universities, um, as well as companies, do have a role to play in this. And I'm sure Merith will come back to this um, in terms of the work that she's been doing in advocating to universities. But um, we really wanted to address kind of all, form, all forms of patent holder um, and, and how they might uh, be motivated to really provide that additional access. I guess, Having said that, in order to not, not repeat a lot of the introductory material that's gone before, um, I wanted to focus a little bit on kind of how you then might enact that um, intellectual property and that technology that's been made available to use um, for real change. And so one of the things that I got involved in after the OCP um, sort of from July last year was, was an initiative as described by Diane, which was a number of UN agencies that came together to think specifically about um, technology transfer. So uh, the Open COVID pledge is a great way of making a clear statement that you are happy for other people to use your technology, um, which is important because even in cases where you know, for, for my a lot of my work focuses on low middle income countries where even in biotech, there is often no patent filed in some of those jurisdictions, um, particularly for foundational or enabling technologies. When you, once you get to actual drug molecules, then things are a little bit different, but there is actually a huge amount of freedom to operate for innovators, researchers, and manufacturers in, in a lot of the global South. Um, but still it's time consuming and, challenging to do that freedom to operate analysis and really kind of be sure. <laughs> so, so the thing I like about the pledge is that you're sure because someone's made a public statement and said, it's okay to use this. Um, and it and because it's public, it's also, also discoverable. And so um, in the TAP initiative, we were really looking at how to take some of this intellectual property that had been pledged or was otherwise being made available and, and how you do the piece that transfers it to um, a manufacturer or a producer in a low middle income country. Um, that was really the, the kind of piece of the puzzle that we were looking at. But I think in order to get to that stage, I mean, step one has to be discoverability of the technology. Um, and so as well as pledges, which are a great and kind of public way of, of kind of putting stuff out there, of course, there's other mechanisms like open source licensing. There's also other mechanisms like highlighting patents that have expired or are no longer in force, which some countries like Kenya and Chile do um, proactively, um, but it's still quite difficult to kind of get that information. So, so that once you've found a technology that is potentially able to be used, um, the next step is really to, to kind of have the know-how and ability to actually use that. And so that's that's the sort of step beyond the pledging where you really need some support often from people who have hands-on experience. So specifically my work within TAP um, was in the diagnostic subgroup where we were looking at um, potential for transferring 
rapid diagnostic tests or molecular tests for manufacture in low and middle income countries, which is still ongoing work. Uh, Diane referenced that the that specific piece of the TAP initiative has now concluded, although TAP lives on in other forms within the UN Technology Bank. Um, however, the work that we did as a, as a group is, is continuing. And, and what we're currently working on is a handbook for local manufacturers in low and middle, in, middle income countries to understand um, the kind of the, some of the hands-on technical nature of scaling up manufacturing, also information around regulatory approvals that they might need, um, how to actually do quality assurance of the um, technologies as well. So there's all of these extra pieces, and particularly because a lot of the technologies that are really useful and really impact, impactful for COVID are in regulated areas. So there's all of this sort of extra stuff that packs around um, and so we I you know we were we were working through that um, and and some of that work has now been picked up by CTAP so I'm delighted that CTAP are also represented on this panel um, but yeah it's tough I mean that's that's sort of the next stage is really like how do you take this um, pledge technology or technology that's been made available in other ways and actually make it um, useful and impactful and so um, Kind of one of the mechanisms that we we are looking at is um, how to set up kind of directories and rosters of experts that could be called upon to help with that sort of thing because that's a lot of the the manufacturers and i'm sure this is also true of medical devices and ppe as well which of course was a, a major focus of efforts during the the covid pandemic and continues to be a major effort of focus um that um it's it's the sort of it's the technical questions <laughs> that often stumble you know i'm a manufacturer so i understand i can manufacture this thing maybe it's been pledged maybe it was in the public domain um but i'm repurposing because i do this other thing how do i actually do that and, and getting that information at short notice is also very challenging so um i think kind of although we didn't make it a requirement of the open covid pledge for the reason that we wanted to keep the pledge um the license associated with the pledge and licenses that could be um could be compatible with the pledge as simple as possible there was no kind of requirement for companies to do know-how um, transfer or kind of proactively work with users of the technology because it keeps it simple it keeps it cleaner the transaction costs are lowered it's faster that was the right approach but you know you have to kind of layer it on top of that um and so that's really the the kind of work that um i've been doing over the last year and it, i think it's really just highlighted that the the IP stage and sort of knowing that you can use something is really the starting point and and having a clear statement that removes fear uncertainty and doubt is really really useful so um, not so much manufacturers but certainly researchers and diagnostic test developers that I interact with on a daily basis like one of the first questions <laughs> is like what's the what's the patent status can I use this is it available um, and you know I am I am not a lawyer I'm a biologist but I do have an interest in biotech patents so in for some of the basic ones I kind of know the answer and and can give them an indication um, but you know it's really it's sort of one of the first things and people have a very even if they believe that it's it's highly probable it was not patented in whatever country they're currently based in um there there's still that sort of like reluctance to move forward um without some level of certainty and so i really like that the pledge provides that because it's very helpful for for um groups that i interact with quite frequently of course one thing to mention is that we we have a number of kind of diagnostic related technologies available under the pledge we currently don't have a specific covid diagnostic i would love that to be <laughs> the case in the near future um but it's really in any case a fantastic kind of inspiration for all of the reasons that were listed listed in the last panel to have um all of the companies that have pledged kind of putting themselves out there and saying you know we are um we we just want this thing <laughs> to be addressed and we're happy to um, put our own technologies forward to enable that to happen, um, even if it has, you know, an impact on our maximization of, of whatever profits we might get, which, as we've heard in the last panel, is arguable in many sectors, if that if that would be the case. Um, but I think it's very, it's very good to see it in certain areas and sectors, and I'm sure Meredith will pick this up later. There are other areas and sectors where we kind of need to do a bit more work, and so, um, so that's something that I'm, I'm hoping this panel can address because you know all, all technology um, that has been pledged so far, and, and many of the kind of areas of technology 
that have expressed interest um, can really be used in the public benefit. Um, but there are so many, you know, that the sort of biomedical space in particular has a very, very clear and very pertinent and imperative um, public benefit potential <laughs> right now. And so seeing seeing some more action in that space would be would be really amazing. So I guess that's kind of to to end on my hope <laughs> for moving forward with the pledge um, is that we do see a little bit more there and we also are able to continue what I think has been a really nice um, way of trying to make the connections as seamless as possible between people having you know the the IP pledged and then feeding it into initiatives like CTAP or like TAP or like UAEM's uh, advocacy work where it can really be taken forward and make a difference so um, thanks again for the invitation to the panel Diane. No, thanks so much, Jenny. I really appreciate it. Um, that's a beautiful segue into our next speaker, Dr. Samal, who will talk about CTAP and its work, which is um, designed to build on not just the IP, but also the know-how, the documentation, and the additional information and data that's necessary. So Dr. Samal, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Here on the other side of the Atlantic, it's good evening already. Good to to be here and thank the organizers for inviting WHO to speak. And also, I, I really want to say a big thank you for everyone who thought about the open COVID pledge and made it happen. You know, because it was a true inspiration when we started thinking about CTAP and how we could move it to with member states and and uh, all the things that come attached to, to having a, a WHO process uh, on this. Uh, the open COVID pledge was already happening and we're really, really grateful that you could join us as partners also because we, we, we saw, as you see, that this, this pandemic brings practical and moral imperatives that every tool we can use can be used against this pandemic, right? And uh, I think there were there were so many things of, that inspired us because of the open COVID pledge, including uh, the, the you see, I'll, 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 if I can move to the next slide, even the type of license and the way you, you're managing intellectual property being made available are very much in line with what we are we are defending as part of the, the principles and objectives of the solidarity call to action. This is a, a, a this is a screenshot of um, of the WHO COVID dashboard. Right, you just get into WHO.int and you get there, and it's it's updated daily. You see, this is a screenshot from yesterday from where we had almost 150 million COVID cases, more than 3 million deaths. And we, we have, as of today, we have some statistics telling us that more than a billion vaccine doses were already used globally. No, but we are seeing what we, we were very much afraid last year. Last year, one year from, you know, six months ago, we didn't know if any vaccines were going to actually work. But we were trying at WHO and other partners, we are trying to avoid what we have seen with HIV, where the technologies that reach uh, low and middle income countries, the, the ARTs, the antiretroviral treatment, the drugs reached uh, low and middle income countries more than 10 years after it started being used in high income countries. And also what happened with H1N1 when we saw maybe five or six months before the vaccines against H1N1 reached low, low income countries, they, the pandemic had gone. This pandemic is different because it's not going away, right? We are one year and a few months into it. And we are, we are seeing, uh, uh, like when I was telling, we have more than 1 billion vaccines already used. 81% of these are used in high income countries and upper middle income countries. 17% are used in low and lower middle income countries. And then you have India there. And India is, has already used like 130 million or 140 million doses already. So what's left? in terms of statistics, and statistics are good for us to have a, some sense of proportion is that 0.3% or 0.3 
or 4% of the vaccines that were actually used in low income countries. So we are in a, in a situation where we say, in, in vaccines is a, is a very symbolic, like uh, other technologies, but there is a lot of hope the vaccine will help us end the acute phase of this pandemic by the end of this year. But if we don't have a more even uh, utilization of vaccine, availability of vaccines, we, we are risking that more variants may come, more mutations that will turn into variants may come. And this is not in anyone's interest. Next slide. So last, last year, uh, Diana already mentioned, we did launch the Solidarity Call for Action end of, of May, I think it was 29 or 30 of May. And it was at the request of the government of Costa Rica. This is the president of Costa Rica on the left. And it was launched by WHO with, with 40 different countries. Now there are other countries coming in. And this is almost one year ago, 10, 11, yeah, 11 months ago. And we are at a point where, next slide, please. We, we are at a, a point where we are talking about uh, uh, a situation where the world is going through a crisis and there, there are discussions in the World Trade Organization about a, a, a waiver to the, the, of intellectual property rights for the pandemic period, right? And what we have on the table also is an alternative or it's not an alternative to the waiver, but it's a, 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 a pooling of, uh, of, of different partners to promote open science to the next one, please. To that open science can help accelerate product development by pulling data and know-how. And this would help to accelerate the scaling up of manufacturing and the, the uptake of new technologies through transparent, non-exclusive public health driven licensing and enhanced technology transfer. I think the previous, I, I did not attend since the beginning, but I, I caught a part of, of the last debate and also uh, the previous speaker was talking about uh, how does this work, including with the technology transfer. Right? And it, it has, it, so it's, we're talking about a voluntary process where you need to have the engagement of the different partners. We are talking about researchers, funders, uh, government, governments, manufacturers. The next, please. So, so, but it, it's not easy. You know, we have a uh, we have a steering group and open COVID pledges and very active in the steering group. We have colleagues who are from other UN agencies who are attending this call today. So we have a pool of interested parties in Costa Rica and this relationship with member states, uh, and we were working very hard to engage the holders of IP and know-how to promote sharing sharing of, of, of information and data so that we, we could advance in the, the areas of treatment, immunization, the vaccines and diagnostics. And we have been, to, we had discussions and I said this yesterday you know, during a, a call with civil society organizations where we we're discussing CETA. We have had bilateral discussions with every producer of all of the of the treatments that were are being the still treatment candidates that are being developed, but also with every producer of all vaccines that came into the market, we had had bilateral discussions, and very surprisingly, this is more it's it's a discussion that's flowing more easily with diagnostic companies. And it's not flowing at all with vaccine manufacturers and a little bit better with, a, with the, tr the treatment, uh, the therapeutic small molecules and manufacturers. Uh, at the same time that we are doing this, we are also working with member states and we are about to launch a survey on what would be the incentives and how, what would be the role of member states. When we're talking about member states, we're talking about governments. Of course, WHO has 196 member states on its uh, part of WHO. What, how could they contribute? What would be the incentives that would make a difference? Financial incentives, 
money, public funding for research and development, uh, regulatory incentives, what kind of incentives would bring in, would take the, the would take next step that the, for the pharmaceutical companies in special right, to come into a, a, a mechanism that is promoting voluntary licensing, it's promoting voluntary licensing through the medicines patent pool and the technology transfer. So the idea is that we will have a discussion paper that will circulate and we we'll to explore alternatives, how this could be taken forward. Because we're thinking about, we need to deal with this pandemic, it's not over, but we also need to be well prepared for the next pandemic. And also we do have, I was working on the policy recommendations for funders to promote equitable access principles in best terms and conditions to public funded R&D agreements. We have some of these vaccines who are coming to the market only in high income countries that were funded through uh, public money, right? And we are having enormous difficulties in, in making the companies uh, agree on, a, on an approach because you know that WHO, Gavi and CEPI and other parts in UNICEF have organized this COVAX facility, which is the mechanism for which we, were, we are providing vaccines through a portfolio to, to member states. We have now 120 member states who received vaccines through COVAX and around 40 of them only received vaccines through COVAX. So this is, this is super important in terms of how can we shape, how can we, let's say, make the market work in, in, a, in a best behavior towards uh, public health goals, right? Next, please. Uh, we are also working, yeah, on a, on a database, and we are working a communication strategy, and and also with further uh, engagements with member states, civil society organizations, and the discussions with member states. We just heard today, actually, that two uh, high income countries have are very interested in discussing in, in being part of joining joining the CETA. And I'm saying this because even uh, in last year, end of last year, we did have a discussion with a uh, UK based manufacturers, pharma manufacturers that was jointly organized by the UK IP office and WHO. So there is, the world is looking for alternatives and uh, CITAP is a good platform for that. Next, please. I'm sorry, I'm taking too long. Uh, Diane, let me speed up. So we do have different, we have a, the, at the center, you see that you have the, the secretariat with the platform, the steering group, a technical advisory group. You have the UN agencies that are partners, the multilateral organizations like the Medicines Patent Pool Foundation or the, or the initiatives like the Open COVID Pledge. We have the member states. And these are the different parts that make this work on one side. The discussion with R&D funders, research institutes, IP holders. We have the push from civil society organizations, the academics and experts to help us. And we have the we have the other initiatives that are connected. You may have heard about the Access to COVID tools accelerator, which is also co-led by WHO with other partners. WHO coordinates the hub for that. We have a, a production capacity task force right now, which is WHO with uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, and that's on vaccines. And we have many other interest stakeholders. And at the end of the day, we want to influence what manufacturers can do for vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments to rapidly scale up whatever technology proves to be safe and effective. It should be against this pandemic. It should be seen as a global public good. Next. As I saw, I already mentioned that we are having this, the, the different consultations. Can I can we move to the next one? And interestingly, just this is my last slide, that, that to say that the, the current work 
that we are doing with diagnostics, we are exploring with uh, two types of diagnostic tools. So we are talking in negotiations with five different uh, companies or developers. Uh, one is an antigen test and another one is a CRISP-based diagnostic. And it's interesting because this is an area where IP has not been, we, we have to learn about the, the how I, the intellectual property rights as a barrier or as a facilitator for innovation. And that's what we hear from industry, but at the same time, how much of it is a barrier in the, for example, for the, in research and development and the, the, the technology transfer and spread of vaccines, but we know very little about diagnostics. So we were, we are very much uh, interested in, in developing this together with the Medicines Patent Pool. You know that Medicines Patent Pool is the licensed arm that the, the, on, on, has a large experience, 11 years already with HIV, TB and malaria, and has expanded its mandate to include COVID products, diagnostics, vaccines and treatments. So what are the next steps? Let me say that we, we are facing, uh, we, this World Health Assembly every year, WHO has a world, the world has a World Health Assembly where all member states have a say and there's a, there are many resolutions that are discussed there. And one of the, there's one resolution that's very important that's being agreed and will be discussed during the assembly, which is a, local, a resolution on local production. And the, the second, which is fundamental for the discussion that we are having here today and also for the, the future, I think I, I may say even be, being stronger, the future of humanity, which is what we're calling a pandemic treaty. You know, because there are different levels of, of agreements between member states. You know that there is a, a tobacco convention globally, right, that all member states ascribe to. You know, it took years and years to be negotiated, but now it, it ended with, a, with countries having to, uh, it, it, it creates obligations for countries and it creates obligations for other stakeholders like industry as well. So what's at stake at this World Health Assembly is the approval of a, of a, of a, a move towards a, the, the drafting of a pandemic treaty that will help the world to not only to, to do what's needed for this pandemic, because like I said, it's not going away by the end of this year. It's likely that we will have, still have problems remaining next year, but also that we'll make the world with better tools to tackle inequality, inequity in access to, to health services and to health products in case of a, a new pandemic. So it's not the case whether we'll have a new one. It's just a time when it will come. I'll stop here uh, and thank you very much, Diane. I'm sorry if I took too long. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, fascinating, complicated work that WHO is undertaking and, um, and it's exciting to hear about the progress so far. We're gonna move on to Marith Basie. Um, she is again, the North American Executive Director of UAEM. Um, we do have a couple of questions for Ms. Samao. We're gonna have to hold those until the end given some time constraints we have on um, one of our upcoming speakers. And if we're unable to get to that or if if Dr. Samal has to leave, then we'll make sure that we get that, those questions answered separately. So over to you, Mara, thank you. Thank you, Diane, and thank you for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. And I will try and be as fast uh, and efficient as I can uh, to see if we have time for questions. But um, for people who aren't familiar with UAM, the vision of the organization is that universities and publicly funded research institutes should really be part of the solution um, to the global access to medicines crisis, so not just COVID. Uh, and this is actually the 20th year that we have been focusing uh, in this area. And it turns out that we have been urging universities to adopt the Open COVID Pledge and CTAP uh, for almost uh, over a year now in terms of Open COVID Pledge and then um, about half of that time uh, with CTAP. 
we launched a campaign in April 2020 called the Free the Vaccine for COVID-19 campaign. Um, and we had two primary goals. The first being that publicly funded medicine should be sustainably priced, available to all, and free at the point of delivery. And the second being uh, really to grow the movement of people uh, anywhere, everywhere who were concerned about these issues and particularly obviously with COVID um, and learning how they could take action uh, to prevent this uh, global pandemic that was sort of happening to all of us and have some agency. Um, so in the same week uh, that I think the OCP launched, uh, that we launched, I should say, we were, we also adopted the OCP. Um, I think one of the first groups um, before some of those tech giants. Um, and since that time, we have been targeting, uh, we started by targeting 50 universities in the US, Canada, Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, UK, across Europe and Australia. And uh, initially it seemed very encouraging in a short period of time, we'd heard a lot from uh, key technology transfer offices and representatives, but um, over time, uh, despite these many creative ways that we were using to uh, capture the attention of these key players, uh, we found that there were a number of different excuses or silence um, from those, from those uh, universities and offices. So we decided that what we would do is then target uh, a handful, 15 initially, more um, specifically, including Vanderbilt, uh, which was key with the Moderna um, NIH vaccine, McGill, UBC, UCLA, Georgetown, and others. Um, but even a year on, uh, while we are close with, I think, two leading institutions here in the United States, um, it is deeply concerning that zero universities have signed onto or endorsed, supported either CTAP um, or uh, the Open COVID Pledge. Uh, and I know that from 20 years of sort of experience uh, or UAM work targeting universities that we know that they are not quick to move normally. Um, and often in, in the work uh, in the past to um, ensure that licensing would be uh, glo globally more equitable, uh, particularly in low income countries, um, that, that wouldn't move quickly. Um, but here we know that even in the US with over 570,000 people dying, you know, these are our fellow uh, citizens, um, universities still have not moved to act. Um, and it's not because universities aren't signing other pledges. This was one of the questions we wanted to see, like what was happening? Um, and they, there have been other pledges that we don't believe um, are as, um, have as much teeth basically as the Open COVID pledge. Uh, and you can see that with some of those, we decided to do some research basically into this to see what universities were signing and what was out there. And we learned through, uh, you can look at our report uh, at, the, at globalhealthgrades.org, which looks um, at the top 60 biomedical research universities in, in the United States. And we felt that we couldn't have a 2020 report card that didn't include COVID. And so that was an additional um, survey that we put out to those universities. And we learned obviously what, what we already knew that uh, not a single university had signed the Open COVID pledge. They hadn't supported CTAP, but 10 universities, about 17% had signed this um, uh, COVID technology access framework uh, that was uh, led by Stanford, uh, Harvard, I think, and MIT. And then 43% had signed Autumn's, uh, and Autumn is the Association of University Technology Managers, uh, had signed these licensing gui guidelines. And I think that also for us showed the order um, that we think uh, the strength of those, uh, those pledges, because it's very easy to sign a pledge if you don't actually have to really be held accountable to it. And I think this was why for us, the Open COVID Pledge was something that stood out. Um, yes, I'll, I'll add the post, um, uh, here you go, go global. Yeah, that's, oh, it should come up, globalhealthgrades.org. Um, 
I will check the website otherwise later, but that is the correct site, yeah. Um, so the other thing that we learned was that despite the universities that appear in the top 10, we actually ended up ranking um, over half of them with an F grade overall in terms of uh, what they've been doing for global access in the specific sort of key areas. And obviously there's a lot of incredible work that's happening with specific scientists um, and departments, but just um, to, to really think about the access issue and the licensing issue, um, we saw that of all the, the top 10, uh, even those, the University of North Carolina has received $91 million of uh, public funds, for example, but they have not a single protection uh, to ensure access uh, or affordability of these COVID-19 innovations developed on their campuses. Um, similarly with the University of Washington, Seattle and Case Western. Um, so only about 30%, 30 universities, 50% of those that we looked at um, really had made any form of commitments. You know, and again, this is in the context of a global pandemic with now over 3 million people who have died. Um, we think it's pretty outrageous um, that, that universities haven't moved faster uh, we are encouraged by those that are, um, you know, closer to potentially signing. Um, but that has taken a year of advocacy um, consistently um, throughout this time. Um, and I think ultimately that's the key piece here for us is that on its own, uh, these, these institutions are not necessarily going to move. And I, I was seeing that also uh, you know, with the WHO and CTAP, that there does need to be this kind of coaching um, or coaxing or public pressure, whatever you want to sort of frame it as, um, despite what is happening and unfolding in front of our eyes. Um, so I think we've, uh, earlier panelists were talking about, you know, alternatives. And I think, um, you know, this is a key moment. I do also think like capitalism is on trial right now with what is happening in the world. And I think there are these opportunities and uh, needs for us to be really pushing for these much more open science approaches. I think there's an appetite, particularly among young people uh, to be driving for the change they want to see. We have these other uprisings happening, uh, particularly the movement for black lives. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we cannot pretend that the decision to prevent access abroad is not, you know, it is, is not impacting primarily black and brown lives. So I think those things are up front and center for the work that we're doing. And I think that ultimately we can talk about innovation and how important it is, but if, you know, these innovative drugs, medicines, treatments really don't get to the people we need um, through these kind of mechanisms, um, they're not really doing their job anyway. Um, so I think we said we'd stop at three o'clock. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. Um, so we have time to, to talk. Thank you so much, Meredith. Meredith, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Meredith, Meredith. Uh, confusion. Um, but uh, I wanted to sort of transition to talking a little bit about some directions that pledges may go um, moving forward, but wanted to remind everybody that we will have, we're gonna talk briefly about some future directions for pledges outside of the open COVID pledge, but then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes reserved for open discussion and questions for the panelists to engage with each other in the audience. And so we're looking forward uh, to doing that as well. Right now, it's my um, pleasure to introduce Brett Alton, the Senior Vice President and Chief Intellectual Property Counsel for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, Brett is gonna to talk to us a little bit about a brand new pledge that is out there in the world, the Low Carbon Patent Pledge. Um, and to start that off, I wanted to ask you, Brett, if you would tell us a little bit about the pledge and about um, why HPE felt moved to organize it. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great, great to be here. And this is an incredible uh, group of people. So. We, uh, we have been looking for a long time for ways to sort of leverage our IP without necessarily asserting it, you know, in an adversarial way. Um, you know, we are moving and have always been 
but increasingly so defensive in our posture. Occasionally we assert patents, you know, when there's compelling narrow reasons to do it, but it's really not what our business is built on. We think that reputationally getting in lots of IP disputes isn't what our customers want or, or the community wants. So we started off by just looking very generally, how could patents be useful to help our business? And when you sort of set aside the sort of monetize, the, the, the sort of direct monetization opportunities, um, we started you know, looking at pledges because we thought reputationally that brings a lot of value to the company, makes our customers feel more comfortable you know, with bringing uh, HPE on as a, as a vendor. And, uh, and that's how it kind of all started. It didn't start with low carbon. It started with uh, really looking at a ton of academic articles and prior pledges and reading Professor Contreras' uh, prior work and articles to help us understand how could we position this in a way that would be attractive to other large patent owners. And um, eventually we worked on this and um, I, I can go into details, but one of the fundamental decisions we made was to not uh, promise or pledge all of our patents in our entire portfolio, because this allowed companies to get comfortable with selecting things that they thought would be helpful without risking sort of unintended licenses that they never really wanted to, to, um, to pledge. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of where it all started. And, um, our, our goal is again, and it's not to build an adversarial licensing relationship with all of these potential, uh, infringers. It's to help the, uh, business win in the marketplace. Thank you. And so as you were structuring the, um, low carbon pledge, um, did you, your experience or other companies' experience with the open COVID pledge play, play any role in sort of how you thought about this pledge? You know, this is a different one in that it's sort of longer term instead of a limited term, but did that experience sort of inform the low carbon pledge structure? It, it helped uh, for sure. In fact, um, you know, I think it was the work that we did with Facebook and Microsoft when we were launching or sort of joining the open COVID uh, pledge. Um, and it's the relationships that we built there that made it very easy for Facebook, Microsoft, and HPE to sort of quickly come together and launch the new pledge on Earth Day. Um, we had been working on this for, I don't know, nine months or more when I got a call from Facebook saying, hey, would you like to join uh, an open or a sustainability patent pledge? And I said, wait a second, we've got something brewing. We think it's really good. And pretty quickly, uh, Facebook and Microsoft, you know, looked at it, they, they liked what they saw and they, they were, um, you know, willing to join us, and which, which is just wonderful. And we hope that they're just the beginning of a, of a larger number. Uh, but yeah, I would say the, the short answer is it was the relationships we built through open the open uh, COVID pledge that helped facilitate the, the low carbon pledge. And so, as you just said, you're hoping that other organizations, other institutions take this pledge and sort of come together instead of having individual sort of one-off corporate statements to the public. Um, as you hope that other companies and institutions join, what do you think the benefit is of having sort of these larger pledge campaigns like the open COVID pledge or the low carbon pledge instead of sort of individual one-off pledges? Well, the, the, the obvious one is administratively, it's really easy to just have a sort of a well-vetted pledge that people are broadly comfortable with. So that when a, that's number one, number two, when a third party is considering, do I need to uh, seek a license? Um, there's one source to go to with one set of terms. So it's very easy to sort of judge your, your sort of position with respect to the IP. Um, 
And I, I think it does, uh, and I think a, a key part of, of why I, I hope it will, it'll scale is all the flexibility that you have in this pledge to sort of pledge what you want to pledge without risking all of your sort of um, uh, most critical assets. And talking about what people might pledge, uh, how were you originally at HPE and at the other sort of founding companies thinking about which patents to contribute to the pledge? So we have a team of uh, about 10 technologists and, and they are, you know, most of them are masters or PhDs who sit and they look at our patents relative to our products and to third party products. And they're always trying to figure out, you know, what do we need this patent for, right? And, and if, if it doesn't have a real clear purpose, it's often too expensive to maintain in your portfolio because large tech companies have very large number of patents and uh, we're one of those. So we have a very, um, you know, it was, it was a very uh, not painful, but extensive due diligence process where we checked with our business leads. We checked with our um, sort of IP goals and what we were trying to achieve. And we tried to find assets that were useful to those who want to either implement or develop low carbon technologies. Um, and yet is something that we as a company could live with and, uh, and, and was that balancing act that took most of our time, I would say. Thank you. Um, so maybe one more question about the, um, open, the low carbon pledge, and then we can open it up for a little bit more discussion about pledges generally with all of the earlier speakers. I guess my uh, final question about the low carbon pledge is, you know, what are the sort of, um, when you look forward and you see like how these pledged assets may actually help address climate change, what are a few of the use cases that you're excited about looking forward to the future of the low carbon pledge? Well, I, I mean, I guess our, our hope is that, I mean, these are patents that many of these patents we actually have implemented. These are not throwaway assets that we don't care about. Some of these are very fundamental and can be included in future implementations, right? So we, we have kind of an enlightened self-interest, I would say. One, we wanna help everyone around us, you know, help achieve our low carbon future. And we can, we can make a small contribution in that regard. We also think from our perspective, um, if companies wanna accelerate their adoption of these technologies, we're available to consult, to help. Um, you know, that's, we, we could never do that for free for the world. That's just too much of a burden, but we can offer help and we can charge a modest fee or could develop into a significant technology transfer opportunity for our company. So we, we like the idea of, you know, being like, I think one of the earlier speakers was talking about the simplicity of a pure patent pledge and then having that as a starting point, and then following that with support services to the extent we can offer them um, to help individual companies use the specific technologies they need. Um, that's, that's how we're thinking about it. And uh, I think every industry is gonna look at these assets very differently. You know, solar, wind, um, geothermal, they'll have very different needs. And I think they're going to look at these assets and they're going to say, oh, maybe, maybe this is something we could, we, we could use. Maybe we'll call one of the companies and get their thoughts on it. And that, that's, them, that's, that's a great thing, I think. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, we've sort of concluded the formal part of our program, but I wanted to invite all of the speakers who have presented earlier, um, if they're wanting to, to unmute their mic and video and we will have the opportunity to have some Q&A with the audience and um, between panelists. So thank you again for joining us. There were some questions in the chat that I'll go back to, but if there's also anyone who'd like to ask live questions, I would encourage you that you can um, raise your hand and then I'll call on you and you can unmute your mic. Um, 
one of the questions uh, I wanted to go back to in the um, in the chat that I think has come up over and over again is sort of the time limited nature of the current open COVID pledge and um, the way in which it's tied to the uh, WHO emergency declaration. And I wanted to uh, turn it over to any of the panelists who'd like to speak a little bit about um, the sort of ups and the downs of having that time limit. Like it may be useful for adoption, but has some questions about sort of the long tail of the pledge. Um, whether any, anyone had thoughts about sort of ongoing public interest pledge structures that were not time limited or any sort of comments about that choice. So if anyone is answering that question, you are muted. Um, anyone else in the chat who had other questions they'd like to put, put, sort of go to our panelists? I'm happy to speak to the time limit if no one else wants to, <laughs> but I think it goes back to a comment I, might, I made in my talk that at the time the pledge was being put together, we were really very much at the start of the pandemic and also wanted to put in place. So, so specifically the, the pledge itself does not introduce a time limit, but there were a set of licenses which were put together to accompany the pledge, which included a time limit. And one of the reasons for that was simply practicality or like the feasibility of a company signing on for an indefinite period of time um, seemed, you know, and we went back and forward quite a lot. There was active discussion about how long that time limit should be, what to tie it to, how to give people some time, sort of a grace period after any point that it finished to, to enable them to do what they needed to do. Um, I'm not sure from a feasibility standpoint, we necessarily make a different decision now a year on, although certainly we we can see that the pandemic is likely to continue affecting us for much longer than we potentially predicted last March. So, so that may in, have influenced the decisions, but I think uh, interesting that other panelists thoughts on this, um, we felt like it was better to go in with a minimal level <laughs> that more people would sign on to. Um, and then, you know, extending it is absolutely possible. It, you can have perfectly well have a pledge that is compatible, sorry, a license that is compatible with the pledge that does not have that time restriction in it. So it's not a compulsory part. Um, but yes, I see Diane has switched on her video, so maybe she can chip in on that as well. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, we did talk about having it be unbounded in time, but at the end thought that that might dissuade enough people given that it was just an unknown. I do want to be clear that um, as of the 1.1 versions of the open COVID licenses, which underlie the pledge, um, there is an ultimate cutoff date of January 1st, 2023. So it's whichever happens first, it's one year after the pandemic ends as declared by WHO, or it's January 1, 2023. And again, we wanted to give people, you know, it's it's good for users as well to understand what, you know, the boundaries are as well. It is useful for those with the technology that are pledging them. And again, we did want to have this buffer period um, with the original plus one year so that people could negotiate different terms, or perhaps the pledgeors wanted to extend them. I think that is one part of the Open COVID project that we'd still like to pursue is um, what next now that we are definitely in the vaccination period, um, you know, the pandemic still rages, especially in India and elsewhere, but um, it is time for us to start thinking as a group and as a steering committee a bit about what's next, how do we start preparing both the users as well as the pledgeors for how they think about their longer term use of the IP and then the relationships that they'll have to forge in order to be um, and um, lawfully and effectively still using the pledged IP at the end of the, at the natural end of the license. Thank you. Uh, Merith, I thought you saw you had unmuted. Did you have a, a comment on that? No, no, I was, I was just leaning in. <laughs> um, so I guess um, I see a hand from um, Robert Reed. Do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, unfortunately, this question may encode an opinion. You know, I believe in the last 20 years, um, a public commons of open and free software has been created by the use of the GNU GPL and, and other licensing techniques. It, it, isn't, it, isn't there a certain danger here in asking firms to 
temporarily give up intellectual property um, uh, in response to a particular crisis, which may occur again in five years or 10 years, um, that we're seeking the wrong strategy as opposed to attempting to build a public commons of baseline medical technology, which is, is simply um, part of a freely usable public commons. Thank you. Well, I, I, this is true. I can jump in and, and uh, address that because, because I think that uh, that was asked, something like that was asked a little bit earlier in, in the conference. And I think it's the same answer, which is that's just a bigger ask for the holders of IP. And the Open COVID pledge was characterized as a response to an emergency. Um, and the reason that um, I think many IP holders stepped forward and the reason that was used to justify these you know, emergency measures was, was that there was a public health emergency. Um, that's not to say that there aren't many diseases um, that afflict many people and many drugs out there that are uh, expensive. Um, but, but we didn't want the open COVID pledge to be sort of a generalized access to medicines um, framework as much as a response to a particular emergency. It could of course expand um, after that and there's nothing to stop pledgeors from extending their licenses beyond the cutoff date that Diane mentioned um, indefinitely if they want to. Uh, but, but the, you know, creating this framework was a balancing act of, you know, uh, how we thought um, we would be able to recruit the most pledgeors and IP holders versus what the ultimate value to society would be. And, and that was the balance that that we struck, which may or may not be the right one. You know, we're, we're still hoping to find out. Thanks, George. Um, I wanted to uh, turn an opportunity to comment on that over to uh, Merith as well. You know, I think we're in sort of one starting position in situations in which we are asking sort of any willing party out in the public to take a pledge. And I think there's a different sort of balance of uh, power and incentives in situations in which you have universities and large research projects that are supported by huge amounts of public money and given a lot of um, sort of preferential financial treatment as nonprofits. And then, you know, when you think about the innovations that come out of those spaces, they might be, you might think about different defaults than the ones that come out of um, corporate innovation, though there's also public money there. And so I wanted to give Merith a chance to respond to that. Sure, I think, I think that's the key. I mean, even pre-COVID, uh, the NIH, for example, um, you know, we saw $41 billion going annually to universities, public uh, research institutes, medical schools to do basic research all the way through to clinical trials. You know, and about a third of that was spent on uh, clinical trials. It's, it, it, it is all the way through. Um, and we know that Last year, $16 billion of US taxpayer money has gone into COVID-19 uh, research, you know, test treatments and the vaccine. So, you know, the public is really paying for this innovation anyway. Uh, you know, the Moderna vaccine was uh, almost entirely 100% uh, funded by the taxpayer, uh, plus a million dollars from Dolly Parton at, uh, at Vanderbilt. Um, but for the most part, uh, and then, you know, knowing also that these corporations um, are, have a guaranteed sort of pre-purchase, assuming that something functions, uh, is, is a massive incentive. Um, so I think we should be going, seeing the, the challenges that we're having with universities, I think we should be going straight to the NIH, straight to BARDA, straight to uh, CIA, CIHR in Canada. Um, and pushing there for the open COVID pledge because it is the umbrella approach. And I do think um, it, it's, it's an opportunity because these universities will be coming back for funds if you make it a requirement and strengthen the conditions attached to the grants. Uh, you know, we have that opportunity and responsibility. It's, it's, it's there in front of us. It's, I just think it's about political will. Thank you. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think it's an important part of the discussion is we might not have the same defaults for all different sort of originating intellectual property. Um, 
One question in the chat that I wanted to come back to and pose um, both to um, Jenny Malloy and also to Brett Alden was the question about how we take this gap between having the pledged IP on one hand and the technological know-how, the supply chain, the all the complicated implementing steps on the other. And I was wondering, um, you talked a little bit about that in this specific context, Jenny, about the ways in which we need these sort of implementing steps. And then um, Brett, you talked about it in the context of thinking through in the future how a low carbon pledge might need some um, consulting relationship to take pledged IP and actually uh, make it implementable for uh, people who are moving into the field. And I wondered if either of you wanted to speak about that briefly. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think it's imperative how we actually incentivize IP holders to go the extra mile is, is a challenge. Um, obviously within the context of, of COVID, um, CTAP, as was mentioned earlier, are in negotiations with a couple of diagnostic um, innovators who may be willing to, to do that as part of the kind of CTAP framework, which is fantastic. But um, it is a significant amount of effort on the part of the person pledging the IP to then go on and, and actually provide that hands sort of hands-on support, if you like. Um, even though now it's it's less hands-on because they have to do a lot of it remotely. But I mean, really for manufacturing, actually physically going to a place and helping somebody set up is, is challenging. So I think we are, we're seeing intermediary groups. So, so CTAP is a great example of one that is trying to merge some of those um, technology transfer needs through kind of working groups and, and other means. There are some um, sort of not-for-profits and social enterprises that are recognizing that this is a a real need and also companies that are kind of this is more in the vaccine space in the diagnostic space there are for example a uk company MoLogic, and a, a not-for-profit spin-off called global access diagnostics that are building a diagnostics factory in the uk which would then serve as a training ground for manufacturers from low middle in income countries who want to then set up manufacturing in their own country to come and learn about the machinery about how to set up the factory and, and so really tech technology transfer and the know-how piece is kind of built into their model, um, which is, is quite a, an interesting but complex model. So I won't ex explain fully, but there's basically a, a for-profit and a not-for-profit that are kind of working together on that. Um, in the vaccine space, there's a number of for-profit companies that are building kind of innovating around modular biotechnology production units that have tech transfer kind of baked into their um, business models as well. So, so I think we, we are seeing experimentation, probably not at the scale that we need to really understand what works. Um, and a lot of the time, it's it, right now, it's more simplistic than that. It's just some, some, you know, companies want to speak to somebody who's done this before. But, um, but it's really challenging to kind of find those people. So yeah, I think there's, I think there's a definitely a role for, for some new models, but also to seeing scaling up of the existing initiatives to really figure out what works. Thank you. I mean, I, I can just add a couple of quick points, but Jennifer, generally, I fully agree. I mean, it's a really big burden to bring your engineers out to potential, you know, implementers and help them, you know, go from a patentable sort of claim to an implementable technology. It's huge. And that's why few people do it for free. And it, I do think there needs to be this um, enlightened self-interest all around where companies will be motivated to not just, you know, donate their patents, but they need to have, you know, there, there, it has to be a sustainable process. We just can't pay people to do all kinds of stuff for free all the time. So uh, I really, I really think tech transfer is great in so many ways, and I like the fact that it's underpinned by, you know, these patent rights. Um, and and how to get there is it's purely voluntary. Um, you know, patents are really just a right to to sue people, and then you're sort of saying, okay, now I'm not, I promise not to sue you if you do this. That's a good start, but it doesn't really help accelerate in most cases the the implementation. Um, that's a lot of work, and that's that's in the high tech space. I would say maybe in the in the in the vaccine space, I really have no idea. Um, but certainly in my space, I don't think people look at patents and say, 
um, oh, I'm gonna, I, I feel very comfortable with this uh, technology now that I know it's in the pledge, I'm gonna go off and start building a team to develop it. It's just one less worry they have. But what they are interested in is speeding up their business, helping them get to market faster. And the patent owners are possibly good sources of that assistance. Thank you. I, I could comment a little bit more on this. Um, if I have a turn. Um, I think it's this is a very interesting conversation because it seems um, understood in this group that a patent does not necessarily convey, you know, all of the information you need in order to implement something. But that is not the rhetoric that we hear from, you know, the USPTO, various patent offices around the world, and and sort of the, the folks that are, you know, for lack of a better term, I would call them patent maximalists. Their position in suing people on these patents is that the patent allowed the alleged infringer to build an entire business. Um, and we all know that that's not the reality here, but but I think we should understand that that's actually not the belief of the American public, at least. And that is why we have these, you know, th these policy debates that are very entrenched and very difficult to get around. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, we shouldn't let the, you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good. These patent pledges are one part of the issue, but, you know, HPE and Microsoft and some of the other, you know, and the other pledge pleasure so far for the low carbon patent pledge, we are also members of something called the Open Compute Project, which is more of a uh, kind of an open source project to actually share designs around sort of data centers and collaboration around those two. So all of those things have to work together. And so if you think about the open source movement in, in, in the software realm, a lot of the worry around putting the open source out there was that there would also be patent blockages there. So we do have to have both. And I don't think we should think that we're stopping here. We're certainly not, and none of our companies are stopping here, just to be clear. But we do need all of those things in order to make it work. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the group about um, thinking through how you enable patents? There was a comment in the uh, discussion talking about you know, whether there were any sort of special considerations about um, platform technologies, whether those are lipid vaccine delivery systems or other repeated um, technological components to individual implementations. Okay. Um, seeing no other responses, I would just give a, a sort of last call for uh, questions in the chat, and then um, we'll go ahead and thank everyone for coming. Seeing no last takers, I'll just say uh, thank you again for everyone for joining us and we look forward to talking to you again soon. We'll make this recording available on our YouTube channel uh, after we've done the live captioning and uh, have gotten that all set up. Thank you very much and thanks for joining.